Yeah. Here we go. And counting down in five, four, three, two, and one. Mr. Ruben. Hello, Cam. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great, great honour. Great honour. A great honour. Well, mm-hmm. this is episode six, okay. so, you know, I'm, I'm used to it now, mm-hmm. I know what I'm doing. You You're know. in the swing. I'm in the swing of things, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm really enjoying, you know, just chatting to people about yep. their lives, really. It's fascinating what, what you can do when you listen to people. Yeah, everyone's got something to say. You just need to be quiet every so often. Just yeah. Just a bit of silence, a bit of silence. Well, look, thank you everyone who's joining us right mm-hmm. now. Ruben, why don't you give us a very quick rundown of who you are, what you do, and just do it all in about 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Okay, so yeah, my name is Ruben. I recently moved to London. I'm trying to get into podcasting myself, do sound design. Uh, I've tried stand-up comedy, writing. Oh, we're going to have a little bit of a fun time today. <laughs> I, I mean, I can talk a lot. That's about as what I mean by stand-up comedy. Um then uh, yeah, I mean, I've, manu- I've done so much stuff. It depends what you want to talk. Like, I did manufacturing, working in warehousing for five years. Wow. Straight, ended up managing like an ent- a, a whole warehouse and doing distribution, and then ended up going into into more creative things because I didn't. That wasn't what I enjoyed. But you are a creative man. I mean, oh, look at you. Like, you're you're creative through and through, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I felt I, it was one of those things where you realise five years into a job that it's like it's that cliche where it's oh, uh, what am I doing here? Mm. Yeah, it was, it was it was my dad's business, so it was like oh. Oh, I've got to be here because it's my, my dad. It's my dad's business. Oh, you don't let your dad down. Exactly. You never yeah. want to let your dad the down. Heart, the heart, my dad's a big man, and the, <laughs> the day I was like, I don't, I don't think I can do this. He's like, I, th- I wanted you to run my business, and I'm like, oh. I can't. And he's like. Uh, uh, <laughs> shit. Well, I think a lot of people will resonate with that. Mm. You know, I mean, yeah. having to. Uh, I mean, the worst thing I think is when it is your dad's business and like, he's built it, and you know, this is this is third child, as he as he put it. <laughs> Me and my sister have always think. Oh, yes, I think that's the one he likes the best, actually. <laughs> well, look, he's probably worked the hardest on it, so that really <laughs> has. Yeah, yeah. But it's funny, isn't it? Because like back in the day, this was like standard practice, right? If your dad was a butcher, that's you'd be it. a butcher, yeah. and your surname yeah. would be butcher. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And sons, <laughs> exactly. And that's sons, it. a famous one. So, um, and what it. When did you exactly decide to just kind of like go and do your own thing creatively? Well, I mean, I was, yeah, so I was, been work- I was working for my dad up until, uh, well, I mean, all in all, I've been done about 11 years working for my dad of like su- every summer I'd go work at his business. Well, since, since it, when he bought it uh, 15 years ago, a couple of years later, once I was old enough, I started working for him and doing summers and then... It got to sort of. I mean, it didn't take me that long of doing full time, like really full time work to go. I don't want to do this. Yeah, and then it was, this is and, it. And then it was just kind of trying to work out what I wanted to do in the background while still getting all the work done because I slowly got more and more responsibilities and ended up until I was like had a whole chunk of the business that I was operating, and I was the only person in that whole warehouse. Wow. So then when I, when it came to me being like I want to move on, I had to tell him a year in advance, and then I had to help train people to do what I was doing I had to help set up a, set, help set it up in a different site and then I was like I, I couldn't even do any How of that did you have that conversation with your dad man I mean that's that's heartbreaking right yeah he just it, he, he could see it coming from a mile off I mean, I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a creative person. My mum's very creative. My mum's an artist and a painter and a sculptor. And he was like, and so it's expected, really. He, think, he, he I'm, th- I'm sure he, a little bit of him was kind of happy. Yeah, he was like, he's. He, I think my dad was like, I got a few years of. I think my dad is be- most pleased that he's given me skills from mm. me being there. He's I've gotten first aid and health and safety and forklift licenses and, and, and you driving need that trucks stuff, and man. driving like, they have and... some heavy machinery mm, that's some it. serious heavy machinery yeah there. i can do, i can do i can, I, have, I have a expansive sort of thing warehousing and managing and all and i've got a lot of skills within that it's not necessarily the best in creative sort of stuff but i can sell it <laughs> but there's something nice about doing a, a job that is a little bit less creative a little mm-hmm. bit more mundane it, it kind of makes you appreciate what you're doing now right it's where some of my best ideas came from i'm telling you so I sat on a forklift. Not even the forklift. The best <laughs> ones. Were, so I so I'd have across the front of me. I'd have. So I did kitting, which is where an, a, a customer would ask for a specific thing with a specific, just basically specific to a customer. So I was like the detail guy with, yeah. So I, they'd ask for an order. I'd go pick all the parts and I'd set them out in front of me. And all day I'd have a bag, two of these, three of these, five of these, ten of these, one of these. Put a label on it, down, and I'd have to do thousands of them across wow. like a whole week. I mean, was that mundane? Very was, mundane, uh... but in, it was like meditative. So in mm. that space, I thought of all of my best ideas. Like so many, I'd be to the point of where I had to, my, like my dad would come down and be like, "You're stopping every five minutes doing the job, and you're extending <laughs> the work you're doing." And I'm like, "Yeah, but I'm having all these ideas. I've got to write them down. I can't let them go." Wow. Just I don't know. In that space, I just really found the ability, and that's where 
because I think I went into the job being like, get my dad's business, money, life, that's what you want, right? And then yeah, I, yeah, start, yeah. I don't know, then my brain started kicking in and I just, I don't know. And then I was like, I need to move out. And then I came to London in the past six months has changed my life, really. So you've been here for six months? Been a, been... Okay, so where's where's home then? What's So Surrey in a little village called Hurst Green, which is just south of, Lo- sa- just south of London. It's very, it's a lovely little village. I like little villages. It's one of the, um, <laughs> it's one of those, uh, the other side of the tracks kind of place. So one side of the track, you kind of go up the hill and you've got all the rich people who live on the edge of London and like to travel into London and they, they like the commuters. The, the, but they're the, they're the keys in the bowl kind of commuters where they ha- I've, I'm, from some friends have been to some sordid parties with some other people's parents. That I- <laughs> oh shit, it happens, man, especially in these rural Seriously. places. Seriously. Yeah, they've Mate, got my, nothing to do. Mm, my friends have seen that they're, like, their friends' parents do. Yeah, I don't, yeah, it's, it's sordid. But then the other side of the tracks, you've got like basically a lot of pikeys and a lot of sort of like you've got a big traveler community and like it can get a bit rough peaky peaky blinders peaky blinders yeah Yeah, but and then it's a lot of um what you would call sort of sort of council house and violence sort of okay yeah yeah, yeah. and and, but then basically the way it worked is they had the cocaine and the people these rich people (laughs) wanted the cocaine and they basically propped each other up that was what it seemed that's what it's an ecosystem (laughs) right they didn't like each other but at the same time they had to be there for each other matata man it's a circle of life right then my dad bought his business and he moved that down to near brighton so we moved down to brighton uh, we were doing. We were, when I first started working, we were commuting. That was pretty horrendous. My dad would wake me up at six, and I'd just fall asleep next to him until we got to work. Oh, that's it, sweet. <laughs> it, it, again, more of him just drilling. It, it good, reminds good me of that JCB me. song. Do you remember by Nizloppy? That uh, that song to me meant uh, actually did mean a lot. Like, I, can I, know, I, I know that word. I know that word for. I'm not very good off like a cappella, but I know that I do. If you put that song, I'd be nailed that word for. It. I'm Ruben on five, and my dad's that's, Bruce that's Lee that's drives it. me round in his JCB. I'm Ruben. I'm five of my dad's, dad's Bruce Lee, Lee. No, and he's holding up the five that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do love that song this isn't a singing <laughs> show but it could be it could be if I could sing it would be exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. of course I'd built it but going to work with your dad man that must be really fun like I, my dad's a filmmaker and uh, I used to carry around his uh, his little tripods and stuff when mm-hmm. I was younger and more recently we've like you know he's helped me with my shoots and, it, and it's kind of mm-hmm. nice to, to work with your dad I mean like there must have been good times right 100% so many good times but it, to the point of what I'd be I'd be so involved in the because I was like bottom rung worker for most of the time that I was there, and then my dad was. But your your dad was the boss, so yeah. like you used special treatment a little but it, bit. But it skewed my view. So like the first appraisal that I had with my dad. So an appraisal was like every six months I go in and you'd have a meeting and you have to d- tick like oh, how Jesus. have you been doing so far? What would you like to achieve? Blah blah. blah. Like what would you like for dinner tonight? So <laughs> but that's where it got confusing because it's like so by the second, third, fourth one I was fine, but that very first one I went into it with such grand ideas because I'd been listening to my dad. I'm like, okay, I know what he wants. I know how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. And he's like, no, all I want to know is how's the work going. Do you need anything in the canteen? Do you need, like, just little wow. bits. So, like, so do you think you could run the business better than your dad? No, in no way. But I just wanted to go in there and impress him. And by the end of it, I was in tears. Like, me and my dad yeah. were sitting across to each... Me and my dad were similar, but not, like... My dad's a quiet, reserved, takes his time, quite methodical, sort of business-minded man. And I'm very, like, ramble. I want to just fire things at you. Ideas, so you, ideas. You what take you more from your mum, then? A hundred percent. Like, a hundred percent. Like, I mean, it's, it's one of, I mean, it's one of those things. Like, you kind of, it's... I think boys do. Yeah, I mean, because you, you get a lot of attachment to your mum. You do. So I think, you do. I think... Shout out to mums. Shout out. Mum, I love you. I do. Oh, he said that um, straight into the camera there. <laughs> this is cute, man. I like it. Yeah, and we, I mean, I've always been we've always been a tight family, but it's like I think I think I was born with more of my dad's characteristics, and then just raised by my mum. And then it's like it, my mum's she's a very loud, creative sort of. But obviously, having a dad that's business minded and a mum that's very creative was there uh, a bit of. I, mean, I guess were you just trying to please your dad at first? Oh, I still am. <laughs> still Have you got daddy issues, Ruben? Ooh, no. Nah, well, I mean, it's it's one of those things where it's more of a. I appreciate it. I appreciate because my mum's constantly smothering me. With, you're doing the best thing. You're doing the best thing, and then that little nugget of when my dad will go, "Oh yeah, I'm re- I like what you did there," and I'll be like. <sighs> <laughs> it's got to you deep. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. But yeah. it's just the way that it just kind of gets, just the way that I received that. It wasn't. It's not like a. It wasn't like it was ever negative. But my dad was always just doing stuff. So it's like when he when when I would do something that would kind of. That's why I think that's why I kind of kept on with the work with him because I was like, 
I was getting so much gratitude from him for doing it, but I was never really doing anything for myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't really want to break his heart by disappearing. But then I found, like, when I did it, it was like, yeah, I've been waiting for you to do this. So I was just. I, I recognise that, man. I think what it yeah. is is that mums are always going to be like, you know, very positive about what you want to do. Dad's always a little bit more critical, mm -hmm. and so therefore you're like, well, what, what do you want me to do? Yeah, yeah. You know? And then especially when I'm looking at my little sister and my little sister's, it's it, and it, it's that classic flip where it's like daddy's girl. And like my sister's constantly getting me in trouble and then going to my dad with it. And then, <laughs> so, <laughs> and what does your sister do then? Uh, my sister's, so she does like music, directs music videos. And wow, so she is a real creative. She's a very, it, our, our whole family is very creative. My dad, my dad's, my dad's the, uh, the sore thumb out of the creative block. <laughs> he's, 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 he's the, he's the bank, I suppose. The, yeah. The, um, yeah, my sister does music videos. She's been doing a lot recently. She uh, had something recently released uh, with a, band called a uh, group called mad teeth with a i've seen the video Source, yeah yeah, yeah. and of course so we had uh nikki p on the show yeah. a few a few weeks ago and uh she did a lot of the makeup was it for yeah that? a lot of awesome makeup yeah, yeah, she yeah, did, yeah. and she helped like obviously it was a they a lot they had a gold everyone had gold teeth so it was like everyone was fitted with gold it looked gold amazing teeth man i mean cool I, I have to say like i recognize a lot of faces in there I, mm -hmm. I didn't see you though oh it's that's a touchy subject i did get my sister because did, you were there on the shoot right she cut me out like, you see a shoulder and you see me in the background she was the whole way through she, I, I was my was my sister's little bitch for the whole thing to the point of where <laughs> to the point, point of where afterwards people were joking at me being like Ruben, do this. Ruben, can you stop that? Ruben, rewind that. Ruben, do like everyone start, and I'm fine with that. I'm, I, I'm, I enjoy doing. I like being part of a crew. I yeah. like, I like getting, like keeping things running. I enjoy that sort of process. It's why I like production work and doing stuff because it's a lot of tinkering and a lot of like just getting stuff. But done. on that day, on you that were day, your sister's my, bitch. I was my sister's bitch. But and then I you thought I'm, there was this one mm -hmm. shot where it was me and this me and this American girl who's one who's one of uh, Nikki's interns. Who we were sat there and we were like, oh, neither of us had done this before. We both sat there like we've got pretend, <laughs> pretend to be on a date and it's just like a two second little yeah, swing yeah, by yeah. of us. <laughs> and so they had the both of us and I was uh, and they. They were my sister. Obviously, was adding a bit more direction, so she felt like I was more involved. She's the director, right? So she's yeah, yeah, she's yeah. there. I could tell she's doing it. She's like, "Oh, do this, do that, do that." But all she wanted was like a two, kind of just half, just like, "Oh yeah, what's going on?" So we had to do. Um, they walked in front of us, and we had to go. Oh, oh, what are who are these? What's going on? These weeks coming into the pub, and um, and she got the both of us, and then I watched it back, and it's just it's her, my shoulder. Cut to the uh. shot. <laughs> Why is that? I mean, do you think that's just because your sister's like seen your face too many times, or you just I, didn't hit the mark? Did you? Oh, I think that's it. I, I just hit the mark. yeah, that's the thing. It's that it's it's the youngest it's the youngest sibling. Did she thing. tell you why? Was it was it? Oh was no, it? she did, no. she just wanted it to be a girl, just because it's the the two the two guys that are in it are both boys, and she wanted it to be a girl who's the re, the reaction. And I got I got it. I got it. it didn't it doesn't I get it? It didn't bother it. It, really, it re, just Cam. I just want to tell you, it didn't bother me. It if you're listening right now, <laughs> we need to reshoot. <laughs> With Ruben as the lead role. No, dude, I get it, man. Like, I have a sister who's, uh, she's two years older than me. How old, how much older is your sister? Oh, no, she's the younger one. Oh, she she's is. The younger oh, one. my God. Mm -hmm. Well, this it's, is, this is tough. And that's the thing. No one, I've never, ever, ever been guessed to be the older one. I don't think. I probably, I don't know. That's, that's probably over What's the What's the age duration. difference? It's a year and a bit. So she's, okay, she's, yeah, yeah, she's, yeah. she's, she's, she's July the year after me and I was born in the May. So it's a year and two months or something. But that's great, right? You're pretty mm -hmm. much the same age. We're so close. We're so close. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. we. I mean, we live with each other. We both live in. We both live in North London together. Amazing. I moved. She lived. Was living there, and I moved in with her. Uh, I tried to avoid living with her because she's a very. It's why everyone thinks she's older than me. She's like very driven, very on top of her stuff. But then that really helped me as well. You know, of like yeah, yeah. being so unsure about what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. I came up here to do a course. I uh, went to do a point blank music school in Shoreditch and went there and I've been doing radio broadcasting and production and trying to learn and having my sister around me who's just constantly like I'm working and then like I'll go up I'll be like oh I'm gonna go out for a couple of drinks and my sister be like yeah what time are you gonna be back uh you got work to do and I'm there like I like it yeah, yeah, I like the fire man exactly yeah. she's 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 Especially with other people, she's very warm and friendly. But with me, sometimes it's quite cold and so That's it's, nice, man. It, dri know. It, it drives me. My sister's there. For, my sister is there for me, and it's Bit like sibling rivalry. One hundred percent. Yeah, 100%. pushes you on, right? Motivates yeah. you. That's it. That's it. And she's 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 good at it. And she, I, I've always, with me and my family have always said we 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 kind heartedly call her the bitch because my sister is a 
she's she's love she's lovely but when it comes to like i'm about to do something for myself and then you you so like if she's in the middle of doing something even if obviously you can't read her mind you can't you don't know what's going on and you happen to ring her while she's in the middle of doing something <laughs> and she picks what? up yes hello what do you what, want what is this yeah okay can't, don't you know i'm doing something okay be and now our family has become a family of hanging up on each other because oh, my si- because my sister's such a ha- like if she once she's like if she's busy and she's done with the conversation, beep, and we all got really annoyed with it. But it's like it's just my, it's just, it's just, my sister just it struggles to change that sort she's of stuff. She's got shit to do, man. Exactly. She's busy. So now we've all beca- now we then we started retaliating, but we'd purposely ring her up just to hang up on her. And now my whole family is just like, as soon as they're done with the conversation, just in. beep. I love it. So you, you mentioned that you've just uh, done a radio course, is it? Mm-hmm. So so is, basically, dude, radio's dead. Radio's dying. Well, okay, is okay. It dead? So that's what my course. That's what my course has been. Look, well, the last three. Months, it was a big been... discovery into whether or not radio is still relevant. It's it's about the future of radio, really, and like Amazing. where people are taking it. Because I mean, for the past few years, B- the BBC have been saying and and sort of Ofcom are talking about shutting down rate like beat the whole of FM and switching across to at least at least switching across to digital. Wow, like purely digital. But there's been a lot of kickback, and obviously, world serve like inside the uk or inside america dab or digital radio might be the bigger thing but still worldwide the most common thing is radio for communication for any like it's 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 still radio unless you're talking about planes and stuff going around yeah yeah, of course the way that every emergency broadcast is there's a radio tower somewhere and it's a radio and so there's been a lot of pushback and especially older generations and things like in norway a few years ago they've switched completely over to dab now and there was like it's even with seventy percent of people saying they didn't want it. So those poor fishermen sat out there on their boats. But I mean, like, this is where it is. This is where it is. It's all yeah, podcasting yeah. now. But it's because Spotify have started doing their Spotify Radio, where now you just have like wow. you have like a few tracks, and then you just and then it automatically goes. You might like this. Hey, I've like just this. had a really good idea, man. Why don't we just create a radio station full of people's podcasts? Like we'll just literally say, "Hey, look, can we use your podcast on our radio station?" That could be, quite... and we go pirate radio style. The only because the thing, the, the thing that makes a podcast a podcast is downloadable and on demand. That if makes you sense. if you were yeah. to put it onto radio, you're no one's going to sit there and listen to that whole that that our mothers back might. to back. My mum definitely yeah, was. Yeah, my, yeah, my yeah. Mom definitely yeah. Shout out to my mum. <laughs> I know they're both listening right now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean you got you got to give the mum's respect. The, my, oh, a friend a friend of mine yesterday was meant to meet up with me, and he was like, "Oh, don't hate me, but I've I kind of got stuck." Talk, I was up here last night seeing my mum, and she convinced me to stay down here. I'm like, "Oh, I couldn't hate the mum, love. It's no, fine. <laughs> just, that's just fine, stay with your mum." Like, I mean, look, there's something you have to do for your for your mother, <laughs> and I think that's uh, that's one of them. Make sure you go and see them. I, I brought my mum here to to the warehouse mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I'll be honest with you, for the first two months, I wasn't even calling it a warehouse. Mm-hmm. I was telling her that I live in a creative living space and like, you know, it's like communal living, mum. Yeah. And, and the thing that gave it away is I gave her my, my address and the address is Harangay Warehouse mm-hmm. District. And she was like, oh, you live in a warehouse? I was like, well, no, old warehouse. I mean, you know, and then she came and saw it. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, well, this place, wait, wait, the place you live is amazing. It's like it's pretty cool. Yeah, to it? the point of where the other units are jealous of your units. There's a bit of politics. There's, there's a little, there's bit, a little of bit of politics. But that's expected, you know, when you live mm-hmm. in a small community of anything. Everyone's I mean, on top of each other. There's like 17 warehouses around here, mm-hmm. you know, and everyone has their own little clique, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of them have only got about five, six people. Some of them have got like 20, 25 people. Mm-hmm. And so they're going to have their own you know backgrounds and what they enjoy i've heard that my unit has been gentrified yeah i don't know like what it, fuck that means man like oh we've suddenly all become snobs it's because uh, it's because ever i feel like it attracts a, i can understand that it would attract a different like some people who don't understand the community might want to come here like more like i want to have a nine-to-five job and be here somehow maybe i don't know if that's what, if that's what they're trying do you think to say? that there's a there's a party difference between like a, like you know the other warehouses and ours because we have a nice place, but we're not partying like twenty four seven. I'd say so. I'd say this. It's not like it's a quiet place, but I'd say if you were to tame, tame yeah, is the word. Tame. tame, tame for sure. Like like I came around here for a housemate's birthday, and it was all done by twelve, and it was all very nice. And but what happened? Like when you partied, it was really like there was lots going on. Yeah. But yeah, then yeah. obviously it was like okay, okay, well, I think bedtime now, and it's like I think I was in bed by ten o'clock. That was, night. And I can understand they just people just want a bit of chaos. Like I live where I live is warehouses as well, and I came back after carnival, uh, Notting Hill carnival the other day, and I was dead i'd just be i'd just come back from a festival went straight to notting hill came back after that and got into bed <sighs> opened my window because of how hot it's been recently and all i can hear is drum and bass up the road <laughs> literally that's it. And, yeah. it and then i can hear people outside my door like 
doing dot like I didn't on the fuck yeah mate I'm here yeah uh, where are you and I'm like. Oh. Mate, that happens all the time. Like my bedroom's right outside the kitchen, and so okay. people like leave the kitchen to go and have a loud conversation because they don't want to do it in front of their friends mm. in the kitchen. They stand outside my door, and I'm just like, mm-hmm. And when they walk away, I'm like, no, come back. I want to know how this conversation's mm-hmm. going. You know, <coughs> but that's the best thing about community living. So your warehouse, how many people have you got in there? So for me, my well, people didn't know that we were we. There's me, my sister, and then two other people in our room, and no one knew that we were a room for a while because there's no number on the door. We're right next to the electrical cupboard no so people way. just thought we were a utility unit so no one, <laughs> no one got us involved with anything people were if packages turned up for number nine they'd be like there is no number nine what you're talking about even though there's an eight and a ten <laughs> so, <laughs> where is this infamous number nine the but, secret door but since i it's, love it yeah since i've moved in there's be obviously i moved everything in and people were like oh, they knew it some people knew it was there but now we've been getting involved with the actual because like here, there was like you had your Olympics and things. We had and Warehouse some, Olympics. Cool we had a going festival on. going on. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of party stuff. And so, have you introduced yourself to your neighbours? Yeah, now? yeah, I've, I've introduced myself. It's you a, go around with a bouquet and like you know <laughs> some it. chocolates. I've been living here for six months. Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was some, yeah it was something along those lines. It's, it's, I do like it though because I, I didn't originally move up here. I did get offered by my sister to come move there, and I was like, oh yeah, loads of people. That sounds good. But at the same time, I just wanted my own space. So for yeah, a year, a year, I moved out into Hove and got my own place and crippled, in Hove. crippled myself money, money oh, wise you know. I, it was beautiful from my window I could see the sea I walked out onto my road looked left you could see the sea and the beach looked right and you had like everything that I needed Picturesque. it was the high street right there I, my, I played rugby for an entire year and joined this club and made loads of good fr- like it was really nice for that year but like it's, I didn't I didn't develop or anything, you know. I just it's a bit comfy. I man. just, I just got, bit, my, I, just, yeah. I had my own space, and it was really nice for that year, and uh, and it was just a nine to five job on my. Uh, for, that was all. I, I just, I did it. And what were you doing? What was the nine to five job? I just work for my dad. Just work for oh, my dad. I see. So well, that was in Hove. Yeah. I, well, no, he it, he was just outside of uh, Brighton. Yeah, so but I, I was, I was like, I, I had to. I moved further away from work, but I had my own space. I got to use a company van and a just nine to five. Ooh, I got the company van. Got the company van, and it was yeah, it was nice. It was. Yeah, it was expensive. Literally, crippled myself money wise. Like every penny that I was earning, I was spending on just living there and having a nice time and stuff. And I was going out a lot, but it was. But being here, I haven't spent any. Oh, oh no, I've spent money, but it's been. I've been a lot more tight on myself. I've been a lot more. Well, you I've, have to be. Right? Yeah, I've grown. Like yeah, I've properly yeah. grown. Like, I mean, we only we only met quite recently yeah. through friends, and then literally just coming here and come like at my warehouse. I've met a few people, then being brought over here, and then you meet all these different people that are doing all these different things. Like London, and especially in these sort of warehouse environments, it's really sort of like feels like something's happening. Like I really, mm. I really wanted to be somewhere where I feel like something's happening. Shit's popping off, man. That's it, man. Shit is popping that off is in here. It. So look, I mean, uh, you're obviously a sound person, mm-hmm. and we're currently doing a sound thing. Hello, um, hello. What do you think of this setup? I like it, man. I'm jealous. Yeah? I'm jealous. I because I, I'm trying to get into podcasting myself, and I uh, I was trying to do some test stuff. Yes, test stuff yesterday, and I sat at my desk, and I had someone sat on my bed next to me, and I had and I've, I've got I've got one mic that works at the moment, so we're passing one passing one mic between each other, and it's like I. She's she's having a she's talking, and I'm like, oh, that, oh I've got something to, something to say, but it's like. I, it's way too rude just to rip the mic away from them and be like, actually, <laughs> actually, you're wrong. <laughs> so it was just like, yeah, it didn't really work. Like, it was nice to get my do some ideas, but I'm just at the very beginning. Like, I, this, this, what you've got here is amazing. I mean, dude, this is uh, quite a, a simple setup, really. Mm-hmm. And because I come from the filmmaking background, like, you know, I, I've always done video. And so when I saw podcasting getting big and, and obviously shows like Joe Rogan, mm-hmm. I was just like, why is people not always filming it? Um, so I was like, well, I'm more than capable of filming a show like this. Mm-hmm. It was the audio. The audio was just the thing. I was like, well, look, am I going to use a shotgun mic? Am I going to use some like lavalier mics? Um, but then I started looking on Amazon and I found these microphones, 20 quid each. Mm-hmm. 20 quid each. They're newer microphones, the NW800. Mm-hmm. And they're plugged into a little Tascam recorder, which, of course, I use for film projects. You get you, yeah. um, and 20 quid each. That's decent. Dude, That's someone decent. is losing out because of this. 100%. I mean, you, the, 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 yeah, I mean, it depends on how technical you want me to get. You got like, go, go technical, you man. Got, you can hear the quality, right? Yeah, they're good. Yeah, you got, good? Yeah, you got yourself, like, I mean, they're condenser mics. So it's like. What's you, the difference? What is a so condenser you got, microphone? You've got condensers and cardioid. Cardioid are basically, you can take them out, rough them around, bash them off a little bit. Like, if you have anyone on a stage, so just I shouldn't have a bash this around. No, because it's the, the components on the inside are just a little bit more sensitive. I need so to remember if you that then. bang it, you're more likely to break it. But if you like, if you those standard mics you have on a stage, you can 
like you see, you see what people do when they're on stage with some mic of those mics. Literally mic drops, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. you wouldn't want to do that with a condenser. You break yeah, up, yeah. Got, and they're a lot more... Exp- I mean, I'm sp- you got these for 20 quid. I might have to, <laughs> to find out where you got them You from. may as well, man. Just Amazon. Mm-hmm. Just Amazon. I'm a bit of a whore for Amazon, really, because, yeah. I mean, like, to get something shipped the next day, Prime... It's weird, because, like, when it first came out, and it was like, this is how much it costs to have Amazon Prime, mm-hmm. I was like, what the hell would I do that? Do you know what I mean? And then you do it, and you're like, actually, this is quite good. And, and now if I have to wait more than a day, I'm like... Didn't want it anymore. Yeah, exactly. Um, Because now they've got Dropbox stuff, nothing gets delivered to my house. One, we don't have a number on our door, so nothing gets... So Well, I mean, it's better now, but we're literally, if stuff turned up and people said number nine, they'd literally just turn stuff away. And now... um, but also, we don't have like a post box, so people like leave stuff on our road, and our road is somewhere where oh, within, dead dodgy within, that, isn't it? within ten minutes something has been nicked. Do you know what? Like, so I used to live in Manchester, and uh, I once ordered two uh, massive hard drives. It was like some client work that we just like signed on new clients. So I was like, okay, first thing I'll do is I'll buy these new hard drives, and the postman left it outside our door, and of course it, it disappeared. And you're a bit like, well, whose fault is this? You know, I left a note. It's yeah, like... I left a note. It's like, no, I don't care if you left a note. Did the note like... say, please don't steal. Exactly. And the worst thing I think is, I got in touch with like, Amazon, and it's like, yeah, sorry, can't do anything about it. Yeah. You're like, what? Yeah. Jeff Bezos, you mm. piece of shit. You like, should get hold of him directly. Don't you get him on the show, man. Yeah. Jesus, get Jeff Bezos. Jeff, in here. come down, come down. Jeff, you, I have you got some, some questions, questions to for Amazon yeah. to answer. <laughs> I mean, well, first, first question for Amazon really is: Are they going to be in space? I don't know if you've heard about the Blue Origin company. This is a, a company that Jeff Bezos has personally financed from his bajillions. And basically, I think what they're trying to do, they've had more successful launches mm-hmm. than SpaceX. Okay. So Elon Musk going down the whole space route has been very public, whereas Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos's company, is very much like quiet, hush-hush. And what I heard, the rumor mm-hmm. on the grapevine, is that they're trying to send up a network of satellites to join the Earth. Okay. So essentially, if like, say we've got thousands of satellites flying around right now, they're all owned by different people, okay. you know, and actually, if they were all owned by one network, then essentially, internet could be beamed down, um, communications. I think that Amazon are just going for world domination. Actually. I was about to say, have the what, Monopoly that is, is a fun game to play. So is there going to be a space version of Monopoly with a little Jeff Bezos? And I like, think so. Jupiter. Oh, yeah. Well, no, the big difference <laughs> is, is that instead of like buying up like houses on the Monopoly board, they, they buy the board. They're yeah, like, exactly. yeah, yeah. We own the whole fucking thing. Uh-huh. So like, uh-huh. there's, there's no one else coming here. Did you ever hear the, the irony of Monopoly when it was made? No the, no. the story of Monopoly is it was made by someone ironically to mock big business for monopolizing things and then the big toy company whatever whoever owns monopoly then bought out that that game no. and then distributed <laughs> called monopoly just playing into their hands literally right? the, I, they they made something out of irony that made them more money than they've ever made before and it was just like wow the, it's a hilarious story. I love Monopoly, man. That's like, that's like the Christmas That's the Christmas game. It was it was a game. I don't know. I, would have, I don't, haven't read the into it fully. but I, I haven't I, seen the film yet. I haven't seen the film. I'm sure it will come out. I'm sure it will come out. Yeah. Hmm. The thing about Monopoly for me, though, <laughs> is that it, it, it makes me feel like I'm a good businessman. What's, what's your go-to figure? I'm the dog. You're the dog? I'm the dog, yeah. I'm the hat. Top hat. You're the like, top hat. Like, like Who chooses top hat? the top hat in Monopoly, man? Well, you can have it either way up. Ooh. I just like I, I like flipping it from each square yeah, as yeah, I go yeah. along. So blip blip. Wow. Just makes me well, I mean the car's the also quite fun as well, right? Mm-hmm. You know, because if your car's not facing forward, then what are you doing? Yeah. I, what are you doing with your life? You know? <laughs> You're going back. And the thing is I remember when I was a young kid and I was thinking, you know what, if I can win Monopoly, I'll be like a really good businessman. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's ever really become relevant in my life. Too many all. people cheat at Monopoly. That's the issue. You're absolutely right. God, yeah, if I'm the banker at Monopoly, I'm like, oh, put that under there. I'm like, just got cash in the bank. I'm like Hold money on. laundering. A, a minute ago, you can pay for this. And now you're buying a hotel. I don't understand yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Well, you know, that's that's probably one of those games that taught kids how to cheat. It did. Oh, and, and to argue. And endlessly. to argue. Yeah. 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 My house was Cluedo, more of a Cluedo family. Ooh. It was always Cluedo at Christmas stuff. Like, like uh, was it like uh, Captain? Tin Musk in the in the ballroom room or something yeah, like with that. the with the socket with wrench or whatever it is yeah yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> with yeah, the exactly. plug socket yeah, yeah, yeah it's exactly. funny because uh, I played or well, I used to work for a client that we used to give away like social media prizes and we started giving away these um, card games of these famous games so Cluedo Monopoly and uh, instead of posting. <laughs> one of the prizes we just kept the monopoly one because it was really good okay like the best card game you've ever played in your life is the monopoly card game i swear to god once you play the monopoly card 
card game, you'll never want to play the normal board game okay. because there's something about it. It's it, I can't even explain to you the rules, but it's a lot faster. You mm-hmm. know, every match is about 15 minutes, so you're just absolutely just going hard, and uh, you know it, it's a lot more intense. I can appreciate that. I'm, oh, that's one thing about those games, especially board games nowadays. It's like okay, I'm gonna be here for a while now. That's why it's it's exactly. a Christmas tradition, yeah, or yeah, yeah. A, no one's no one's that bored anymore. Everyone's got too much. There's to some do. board games I'm a bit like, no, I'm not playing Scrabble. Mm, but a lot of my, I, I've, I, I'm, I'm the least nerdy out of a massively nerdy group of friends. So, wow. So all nerds, all, all, all purely very like. So there's a lot of, let's play Dungeons and Dragons. There's this new board game that's come out. I want to try. Let's go do Magic the Gathering at the local place. And I'd go along, and I was always the worst at it, and I'd always lose to everybody, and I was always just terrible at everything. But all my mates were absolutely bonkers for it and i'd kind of get into it but it was never really my thing i don't, never really understood how I'd, i was always into like let's play let's watch the rugby game or let's talk about it and no one was ever interested i just don't know why i, st- I was just tagged along just going to all these things that i was terrible at but like that's because you're a kid right and, exactly and, and you were just being pulled left hanging right out with the cool kids the nerds yeah. the nerds are slowly becoming the cool kids the nerds they? are dude i remember They're when pokemon cards anymore. got onto the playground and that kid who had like the most amount of pokemon cards was like that's it the boss yeah. that's it you're the boss you yeah. know whereas it used to be like the rugby boys or the football boys whereas now it's like who's got the pikachu shiny 100 percent. you know yeah, that's yeah. that's currency these days mm. and now i don't know what actually kids these days man like, i'm 27 now how old are you 25 25 so i don't know what these kids play these days the generation gap's getting smaller as well because generation is based on like cultural shifts and every every however many years you've got a new person who's topping every charts and beating it and then but no one no one who was born six years seven years previous cares they've all got their own it, it seems to be everything's getting closer and smaller and new things and everything's getting i mean i suppose with social media you just oh i want to get famous so it's like you're famous super quick and everyone everyone in that small window loves you and then it's like oh next generation's new Mate, these kids are fucked up man honestly like they have so many more pressures to deal with than we ever did yeah like, yeah. I think there's something nice about the fact that our pressures came from our friends but then even us and... it seems it seems to just get harder and harder like i spoke i spoke to my dad I remember having a conversation with him about um, about sort of I want to find something. I, I don't know how to find a job. How do I find a job? And my dad just went, well, I mean, when I was younger, I literally just walked down the high street, walked into any shop and said, I'd like to try out a job here. And they'd literally that day give you an apron, go, go on. Then like, he was like, I went into a butcher's, did it for two weeks, didn't like it, went down the road, went into uh, went into a betting shop, didn't like it, like whatever. Maybe just, that's the way we have to look for jobs now. We'll just I'm, walk in and get it, right? But you, I mean, that is, a, I'd, I'd always say walk, it, walk into things and, and, like I've been trying to get into, I've been uh, trying to do a bit, well, do a bit like modelling work, that sort of thing. Ooh, mm, just, walk into Vogue. But but like I, I, when I was when I was a kid, I went into one of those, or not a kid, but like a teenager. Mm. My mum took me and my sister to like a modelling agency to try and do it, and you could do walk ins. Now I, I turned up to one, and it was like, no, you can't do walk ins. No one does walk ins anymore. It's all you wow. have. You have to get headshots and send everything in. Yeah, and, have a, and then you have to attach your social media, and then they. Have did to you get the job media. when you were a kid? They? No, they said this. We went. My mum took us in at like fourteen, and they're oh, like, "You've got to man. come back when you're 16 And I was like, "Okay." Well, once you've grown know, out of that, my that mom, weird. My, my mum obviously saw something I, I didn't because when I was younger, I just I was shaved head, big plug ears. Like I, I, I used to get bullied for my looks, and so I was like, "Why am I coming to a modelling thing?" Wow. Yeah, I never really understood it. I mean, was bullying ever a big thing for you? Cause, oh, massively. Yeah. When I was younger, I used to get bullied a lot. Like, to, like I'm still quite... It's only... It's, again, more of these things about being in London at the moment and surround, being surrounded by so many people who are doing all, like, their own original things. It's like, when I was younger, it was all... Especially when you were a kid. Like, I was, I've was, i always been very much, like, my own thoughts, my own feeling, like, do my own thing. My way or the highway. My mum was always like, wear your own clothes. do dress, Like, just do your own thing constantly. So it's like, I'd, I went... Every school I'd go to, so primary school turned up like immediately, like I'm gonna try and make friends with everyone and talk to everyone and do everything and be ev- and, and all of, everyone's like, Ugh, who's this giant lump of a kid that's turned up and is trying to hug everyone but crushing their kids because it doesn't matter. <laughs> and all of a sudden, no, no one, no one really got me. And I was, I've always been very emotional as well. So being an emotional like boy, especially at a young age, it's like I used to think I had anger issues, but it wasn't anger issues. It was more just that I was easily my emotions would come to the surface easily so it's like if i was sad i'd be sad really quickly so on and so on but then it would turn so people would the kids at my school would know that they'd just have to say i remember the that one of the tactics was to send this one kid called martin who's now a close friend of mine but i always felt bad to him they'd somehow trick him into coming over to me saying something that would wind me up knowing it would wind me up and then i'd chase him around the thing until i caught him and then jumped in and started like 
but that kid, was fun for them, right? That, they'd be st- all, I'd, I'd stand up and I'd just see a group of boys off in the corner, like pissing themselves, laughing, and that was years of my life. And then I went to secondary school, and then I, two weeks before the end of primary school, I was told that if I got into any more trouble, so basically by the end of primary school, I didn't have any breaks, I didn't have any lunches because. Mm. I Take mean, it away from him. Yeah, because because they they were they were setting me off, and then I was reacting to it, and then I was a lot bigger than them, and then I'd hurt them or do something that their parents wouldn't like, and their parents, and then they'd tell their parents, and then I, all of a sudden I was this big bully. Yeah, in school. the big bully. Wow. So two weeks before the end, my head my head teacher was like, "If you have one more, if you have one more." I'm going to stop you from going to secondary school. Like, wow. You know, as if that's like, you know. I don't know how she can do it, but that's what she threatened me with. Fuck. So then I internalized everything. And then I went on to secondary school just as this mopey, no one talked to me. I don't, I don't. And then that was the next like five years of me dealing with all this stuff. And then I got different sort of bullying and it was, yeah. Oh, dude, school can fuck people up, It can probably fuck you yeah. up. And it's, it's only the past few years where I think I've really started to like work through my anxieties and insecurities over that sort of stuff. And I still get caught up in myself. Mm. Like, I'm really good at working on other people's projects and I like helping people and being part of a team. But when it comes to like my own ideas, even though I've got a lot of ideas, I instantly like start to crumble and like my confidence just breaks It's good open. though, man. Like, you got to keep, keep in touch with your emotions. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's probably something that kids aren't, you can't really teach it, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you really can't oh, teach really, a kid like, to Especially to cry. boys. Like, I can understand what where a boy who sees another boy who's being emotive and maybe getting attention from other people because of their emotions and then this boy who's like I don't know why you're feeling this or what you're feeling or mm. why it even matters and I want this attention and I'm going to hurt you because of it or I'm going to wind you up or I'm going to get everyone to laugh at you and I, like it's not like I can't understand it mm. because Sometimes I'd use those tactics back because bullies, the bullied become bullies and that oh, sort of mate, stuff. I completely agree with you, man. I mean, and the worst thing is, I think, so f- for me personally, I was probably the op- a little bit opposite to you, whereas I was just trying to people please, right? Mm-hmm. And because I wasn't visually big at all, like I actually went up to the bigger boys and tried to impress them, okay. you know, but eventually you become the problem, mm. you know, where actually the real problem was you didn't feel like you could fit in. Mm-hmm. You know, you walk 100%. out into the playground, and you're like, well, where am I going to go today? That corner or that corner? But then no one does. I think that's the thing. Thing. That's the that's the thing that ch- ch- children don't get through their heads until long. Like I mean, only recently for me, it's like you look back on it and you go, all of all of us are in the same boat. All of us were unsure. Everyone was just clinging to someone else, and then so, like I just happened to be yeah. someone someone who was just floating through it. And then I just I always remember getting to like year nine, year ten, where because previously it felt like everything was you wanted to be like the cool kid or you wanted to be like the cool thing that was happening or you wanted to wear the thing. Like, everyone wanted to be like each other and then you get to, like, 16, 16, something like that and then you go, oh, I want to be myself. And then all of a sudden being original was cool. Then all of a sudden people started talking to me more. So people started coming up to me. Oh, Ruben, dude, come to this party. And I I was already in that place where I hate everyone. I was such a mm, cunt to everyone. Who wow. came, every, anyone who came over to me was like, you bullied me for years. For years, and now you're just coming over to me, and be like, "Do you want to come to this party?" And they're like, "I don't remember any of that." It's like, of course they don't. They're just impressing people around. Yeah, I got a lot. Of but that. what do you even say to kids these days? Because like, obviously, so we're grown up now, and we mm-hmm. we understand that all that time was fucked. But you know, that's the, that's the way it is. Like, what do we say to kids now to stop them feeling like this? You don't. I don't think it's words. I think it's actions. Like, I, I in some point in my life, I will work with kids, and I will do something. I want what I feel the thing that helped me the most because obviously you'll only really understand the type of person you were especially at childhood like I'll never really look at a little girl and be able to go I know what your problems are or I'll be able to look at like a like a a kid in a different situation but I I can see the kids in my like I can literally see kids who are going through this like I can see their faces and like oh I remember pulling those sort of faces and thinking those sort of thoughts and I'd love to the thing that helped me the most was exercise and like really understanding how to use a gym and things like that like I went my so you, you took out your frustrations about being bullied in in the and it wasn't it wasn't even way. that it was more it was more because all it was was well, I you were going to beat the so shit much, out of yeah, them right like, I had so much energy yeah, and yeah. so much like stuff and it was it could come out in love like I, I, when I loved when I cared for someone that energy came out in me as in like over like to the point of where friends would be like oh, way too much and it's like and I learned to reel that back in but it's just about being able to expend some of that and you see kids going to the gym because they know that getting like muscles and stuff especially boys is so you'll see but none of them know how to use any of the equipment mm. and I'd really like to offer like a free service where I could go get people to go into gyms and kids that are there that have memberships 
I don't know how this it is work. such a good idea. Given, and then get just 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 be like, look, you're, you're here because you see them and they're just like dicking around in the gym yeah, or they're yeah, trying, yeah. they or they're like on something for a minute and then they someone looks at them and they go, oh no, I don't think I'm doing it right. I'd like to just go in there and just give kids confidence because it literally was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. Like, you see, I remember the one kid that that did go to the gym and he was a fucking asshole, man. Like yeah, I think that there's always that, fir- that that the first kid that you know that has gone hard on gym and because when you're like 12, 13, man, your mm-hmm. muscles like multiply. Like, yeah. fucking like just next yeah. thing like six pack next thing eight pack next thing this guy's like beating people up and you're like mm-hmm. he literally is wedge like you cannot mm-hmm. fuck with him mm-hmm. but what sort of age did you start getting like seriously into so into i was i played sports sports for a long my dad's my dad is that why you're tall i don't know I don't know. Is that does that happen because so, of sports? I feel so like I've always uh, so I got trapped in a ruck. I'm, at I'm six foot five, and I my mum smoked heavily heavily when she was pregnant with me, and they always say that that's going to stunt your growth. I've Jesus. always I've always said am, sure? I, am I meant to be like seven foot something? <laughs> I'm never been quite sure. But yeah, I, I originally got into rugby. Rugby was my sport, and it always still is. I, I, I haven't found. I'm going to try and find a team in London once I kind of set my podcast and find a bit more of a schedule because you got to properly commit to do yeah, it. Yeah, of course. Um, but yeah, sports. And then I never really went to the gym or anything. And when I played rugby, it was great for that hour a week. And I'd go there and I'd lose my mind. Like my dad would be on the side of the pit, even even to the point of where after I started going to the gym and then got back into rugby, my dad was like, you're quite tame now. And it's because I'm burning all this energy, then going onto the rugby pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so instead of just being all, my, like my dad's like, you'd be all over the, like I'd get from one side, I'd beat wingers from one side of the other pitch to make a tackle just because, I was, and I'd just have this rage on my face. But now I'm a lot more methodical. But then it was probably like, because I was one of those. I went to the gym with my dad, basically, and I'd get on machines, but didn't know how to use them. And then my mum, we didn't. My dad didn't own the business at the time, but my mum, like, spoke to the my the original owner of my dad's business and said, "Look, we want some. We were, were trying to pay for a PT for our kids. Would you do this?" And then he got involved. Like, there was a couple of other kids, and we all like went to the group, had a PT, and just. I don't know, she just showed us how to do it. And then me and my sister went with her and she was like an ex-bodybuilder and she was tiny and Bloody she hell. just ripped. Yeah, like yeah, absolutely yeah. Jacked. One of those ones. She used to do she used to go do professional things and she's like orange all over and she eats like broccoli and just drinks red wine with chicken all the time because apparently like a bit of red wine's meant to make, I don't know. But she was proper into it. So that sort of enthusiasm and that sort of like showing me how to do it and the burning and that burning that energy especially was so good for me rubs off on you mm. i like it i mean like so i was a dancer um so i was contemporary dancing break dancing mm-hmm. um so that was kind of my physical activity oh, that's cool um yeah i mean it was it was a bit different you know mm-hmm. and i think that's because i got kicked out of rugby mm-hmm. on my first day of doing it um that's a hard I, thing to do well i scored a try yep that's the right word that's the right word and um yeah i scored a try and mr innes he um called it out he was like, "No, nah, you didn't. You didn't score." Because what happened, of course, is that all the boys jumped on me. Mm-hmm. They all grabbed the ball back and then put it onto the other yeah. side of the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, "No, no, I absolutely got that ball over that line. I swear." And he was mm-hmm. like, "No, no, no." And I was like, "Right, fuck you then. I'm not playing this stupid game." Mm-hmm. And I just like sat there. And he was like, "Well, you can't just sat, sit here. You have to run around the field until the game's over." And so I just walked my way yeah. around the field. I was like, <laughs> well, "No more rugby. Rugby is." respect the ref you don't respect the ref you don't respect the coaches you're out of there it fuck is. the coach man <laughs> fuck the coach man I scored that try man that but, was the worst thing but that's what that, and everyone saw it as well man rug, rugby rugby's not for you Cam I'm sorry oh, rugby's Jesus. not for you stick to the dancing fuck. stick to the dancing it's a because because that's always something that every coach every coach will uh, maybe not uh, that sounds a bit tough how young were you I was 15 okay that might be a bit young but like when like it's when I'm in clubs, especially like that. Might that sounds like school? Is that school? It was rugby? school, yeah. It was definitely school. If, if you go to a club, once you get into teens, like late teens, especially coaches will you'll turn up and coaches will be like, right, I'm not taking any shit from you. Like I joined Hove Rugby Club, and I on that first day, I, again, I'm a little bit of an emotional guy. First day, I'm not your typical rugby person at all. I'm colorful, wear bum bags, get the piss taken me constantly out of people. But I like that. I like that sort of that sort of give me shit, and I'll use it and so I turned up and the, this one forwards coach um, basically there was a few new people there and we were all doing some scrum scrummaging so we were all getting down against the machine and pushing I'd previously hurt my leg and I I was just pushing through it 
And then as I was about to be like, oh, my leg hurts, there was some kid who was like, oh, I'm lightheaded. Oh, I don't think I can do it. Saying lightheaded. Like, unless, like some, these, the coach we had was like an ex-pro and he was like, lightheaded? Fucking pussy little blah, blah, blah. Made this kid cry and he walked off and I'm like, my leg, my leg really hurts. My leg really hurts. And I, I mention it and he's like, what, do you want to stop or something? I'm like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> and then I went and carried on and then went on. So then we did a, a training match. Went and did the training match. Five minutes into it, I'm hobbling around. He brings me over and he goes, what the fuck do you think you're doing? You should have told me. You should have walked off. And I'm like, yeah, but I was, he was like, yeah, but it's like, what do you mean? What, you want to play? You want to damage yourself more and then not play at all? You can fuck off, mate. And then I walk off, go sit down, just go, oh, have a little bit of a cry. Oh, bless you, but then I, I come, I come back the next day when I don't even have training, apologize to him, let him know. What's, and then I take so much from respect, that. Respect, right? Exactly. Man. That's it. That, wow. And, and when, they, when you show the respect like that, I feel like that's a massive thing that I appreciate in rugby. Like I, I did football for such a long time, but people are such arseholes to each other. Yeah. Such yeah, yeah. Ar- especially the ref. It's like, the ref's going to make wrong calls all the time. The ref, as, the ref will make wrong calls. And like with that try, I've I had something very. I've I have only scored one try in my life, and the second try that I th- I know I scored oh, got call, got called out, and Fucking and it robbed, like mate. I was I was mortified, absolutely yeah. mortified. But I don't know. You look like a bit of a winger though. So was were you on the out in the wing? I have no idea, mate. Okay. I was just running wherever I could, I could get the ball. <laughs> but this is it because obviously that like, there was always a group of of lads who played rugby, and mm-hmm. so they were always like, oh, the rugby stars. And they're pricks. Half of them are pricks. Well, actually, I don't know. There's something about rugby, and as you're saying, like football's a little bit different. Rugby seems a little bit more like respectful. Certainly, uh, my my some of my family members love rugby. Mm-hmm. I don't really see the appeal in it, but they say that when they go to a rugby match, it's obviously a lot nicer than football match and I don't know, man. Well, you can, I mean, oh, so look. I don't want to talk about rugby, man. I'm fucking, you know, you know, the worst thing is it just makes me upset because oh. I know that the only one try I've ever scored in my life was disqualified. But you know you scored it. I know I scored it. You know it. you scored it. Uh, yeah, I know I scored it, but those fucking bastards who, anyway. You were too good for him. You were too good for him. That's what Listen, it was. Listen, Ruben, let me, let me give you some more water here. Much. I always take care of my guests. Oh, you're and, such um, a yeah, one of the things I, I'm doing for my guests, sorry, I got a bit of water in you. Right. Um, presents. This oh. present is for you, Ruben. Uh, before you open it, I'll just quickly explain that. I'd like to just quickly show you the, 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 the wrapping. This is a beautiful job. I actually got job. so lazy that I couldn't be bothered to even tape it up today. Everyone else had like nicely um, wrapped presents. It's all right. It, I feel like it's matching a little it, bit. It looks it? lovely. I mean, so long story short, there's a 99p shop near me. Mm-hmm. And uh, every time I have a, a guest on, I just go and get something okay. for them. Now, because you're a sound person, this is related to sound. <laughs> so why don't you open it and then obviously explain to those listening what it is. Okay, so as you as you can hear, I am currently opening the package. Oh, Shh, it says and now I. This is ear protectors. I didn't want you losing your hearing, mate. I thank you very much for this because th- this will be perfect for sleeping because outside my room is a nightmare for drum and bass. That's why I bought it for, for you, mate. Gym, That's the, it. And also, and, and also, I can use it when I'm at my sister's work and she's shouting at me, telling me to do things Absolutely. as well. I'll find many uses for this. Thank you very much. No Karen. problem I'm sorry, at all, I'm man. sorry I didn't bring anything for no, you. No, no, you're not supposed to, mate. You brought yourself, you brought your stories, you brought, you know, everything so, about what you're talking to me about now is inspiring me. Yeah. So you never know, I might be on the rugby pitch mm-hmm. field. Field? One of the what do they call um, them? You've confused me. I'm now. not going to play rugby ever again, <laughs> but, you know, the, the ear defenders are to make sure that you as a sound person... Always maintain your sound. Keep that, the, keep that the quality me? up. So sorry, my, my phone is, is buzzing dun, right dun, now. Dun. Um, okay, so talking about sound, mm-hmm. because I'm a filmmaker. Uh, filmmakers don't usually understand the things that sound people understand. Do you ever sit back and, and listen to stuff and just be like, well, it looks great, but it sounds awful? I have been. I have been. I, I, it's obviously, I think this six months has made it a lot more keener. Because I I've been doing my course and been listening to so much uh, so much crap as I've been trying to like edit stuff together, but like you can you can really tell the difference between a lot of stuff and like even to the, like some of the people in my co- like course they've been doing it for such a long time I'll play them a bit of audio and I'm like oh this sounds oh, this sounds really nice and they're like it pops right there and I'm like oh 
<laughs> Great. And I'll probably it probably pops in your mics as I said it popped right there, and it's <laughs> they're so anal with it, so yeah, anal yeah, with yeah. it. But it's once you tune your ears to it, you just can't stop hearing. But I like that though because like so <laughs> you know I'm always uh, you know filming stuff and I'm always doing interviews and all sorts of stuff, but I don't really take too much care on sounds. Mm -hmm. Like sound design is always quite fun because you just go onto YouTube, rip a bunch of sounds, and then mash them all together, and it kind of sounds all right. But I don't think I've ever really stop to listen to Mel. Well. It's hard to so sound as a whole is like with with in, with with visual you can take a bit of visual and there's you can kind of keep it as clean as you want it and you mm. can edit things in and you have a lot more control. Sound is you there's just one if what what you're recording through this mic is just one layer of sound. So whatever it picks up, if it picks up people outside them in a chat, if it pick, it will That's it. That's it. Like that's you can it. you can try and re remove as much you can remove it's easier to remove a constant sound like a me you just find a blank bit find it and then it'll take it out of the whole thing to a degree but you never like sound is something that's so hard to really it's the environment you need yeah, to control yeah, yeah. rather than stuff afterwards but that i quite like that i like the roughness of it i like sort of like going out and recording people and i've been trying to find people that would be interested in doing things with me where i could so like things at festivals like there's a friend who does something called feral stories where she gets people to gather around a fire and tell really and admit some horrific things that happened I love in their it. Oh, and i wanted to amazing. do like anonymous podcasts where i like on site you gather around and like even if it was individual however it worked and just get them and then you could i thought that would be really nice um but the, the quality of sound is just kind of like I think it's more warmth. Well, look, now that like microphones have got really good and uh, mm -hmm. you know they're pretty portable. iPhones, iPhones now as well. Yeah. I, I like I like the sound of just using an iPhone for yeah, a lot of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not quite like like this. No, it's not at but, all. But um, the, the little like plug-in lavalier mics you can get just for an iPhone is phenomenal. Mate. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was doing I was doing something for a friend yesterday who was recording an interview, and he literally just got his iPhone little yeah. plug-in, and then Back I was, that's, that's it. And it sounded the quality was good enough for what you want. It's just about. It's and just, you know, what? It, I trust it more. Mm -hmm. Like it's weird, but like you know, I've used this little Tascam thing with um, you know lavalier microphones, like nice Sennheisers, like three four hundred quid microphones, mm -hmm. um, and then you know there's been a problem with the power or so whatever. Whereas the little Rode Smart Lav Plus microphone that I can just plug into my phone and it just clips onto them, never had an issue with no. it ever. No. Oh, now I'm going. Are you buzzing? I'm Are buzzing. you buzzing? I'm buzzing. Ruben's buzzing. Uh oh, uh oh. Sorry. Okay, cool. So let Ruben, let's um let's segue into a, a different section of the mm -hmm. show then, because you're talking about making your own podcasts and this is why I think it's fun that you're here because okay. yeah, you know yeah. this is a new podcast. Um what are the crazy ideas you're currently thinking of right now for your own show? So I have I have to, I have to, I have a very grand picture of what I want in in like the long the long sort of like goal. So I, I want to have like a network of podcasts and where wow. I, and where I have people who you want to do a Murdoch. I want to I want to yeah to a degree to a degree. Well, I'd say more the so, emperor. So there's there's a, there's a group. So there's um, YMH, which is your mum's house, which is a podcast that I really love, and they've they were just their singular podcast. It's a husband, it's a comedian husband and wife, and they they just chat and then it kind of became bigger and bigger and then they took on board friends podcast and it's kind of become like a network and they're all supporting each other and i really like the idea of that so i kind of wanted to do something similar uh, where i just find a group of people that like like enjoy making podcasts and have ability like have the ability to produce podcasts and kind of like just get something going where we can keep it all it's not i don't really care about making loads of profit but just to keep it all going and just have stuff that's interesting me all the time and different stuff so the two ideas i've got at the moment one that I'm trying to run with is what fucked you up, and it's, I love it. So that's going to be talking to me about parents, and it's based off a Philip Larkin poem called "This Be the Verse," where he talks, where <coughs> if I can remember the first line, um, uh, I can't remember the first line <laughs> I had at all. I, um, it, it's a great it, title, though. I mean, like that's certainly something that that would get. It's yeah, just because in, in, with inside that poem, he says that the thing that fucks you up the most, but they don't mean to do it, is your parents. Like they're only trying their best, but through their mistakes and through their things, they don't mean to do. Like that's what shapes you for those first years, and then you go off, and then you like. I, I one thing that I that I always say is that the amount of times that I do something, and then I hear in the back of my head, my mum's always going, "You should have done this. You should." It's like it's it's always there with you. So that was my idea is to get people on and just talk. I like that and yeah, to talk yeah, to people yeah. about their own. I don't obviously. So people have got such deep stories about their families and I don't, I'm not trying to bring up traumatic events or anything, but I just like to talk to people about 
different opinions and how they've got to where they are like we're all, like especially people around me like we're all in such a similar position but everyone's come from such different routes and it's like there's this one big choice in your life that isn't your choice but it's these two people who at the time whatever situation they were it's like they created you and it's like how how like how i don't know just i just i find that really interesting i feel like we're very lucky though because like our parents parents had more i think they had more of an impact on mm -hmm. their lives i think we we grew up in the information age where you know we we now know that there's lots of different styles of bringing up kids and some kids are more privileged than others mm -hmm. and so you kind of have a choice at a certain age for to either forget what you know your parents have kind of you've got to be a lot more sensitive about it because people are a lot more aware like as, if i did this 20 years ago if they were podcasting and i came on for example i was gonna the, i started doing a bit yet yeah, the other day and i was talking it's like we got ice creams and like oh is that the treat that your dad would have got you if you went to the shop thinking about my dad going to the shop and being oh is there anything you want from the shop it's like oh my dad i didn't know he didn't he wouldn't do anything like that my dad's like a smack it or something like i feel like yeah, in my brain yeah, that's yeah, like yeah, oh god i'm gonna right. to talk to the wrong persons but it's i think broaching it is a good thing and and people people everyone's got something to talk about it but when it comes to their parents and they they want to it's that nitty gritty. That, mm. Like I've always thought that podcasting, especially, is all about that bit, the bits between. So it's not necessarily about the stuff that you're the the main topics. It's all about that little bits between of, and that's all that families are. It's all those little intricacies of all those little it's traditions, nuance, right? all it's those like little a, lessons you yeah, learn. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, today is that today may be different because it's not so hands on hands on sort of like raising of children. But children are so much more aware of what their parents are doing and ha like. So it's much more of a cult. Like I think it's even more interesting. Like I'd love to. I'd love to get a kid, like someone who's like a, a kid. kid. Yeah, to, and talk to them about <laughs> what's happening in your home yeah, right like, now, what's child. Going, <laughs> yeah, what's going? What's, what's going? Like I mean, pretty much now, Google is their new parents. One hundred percent. Like know. I remember being on a plane and there, there was a there was um, an Asian couple with their kid, and we were go. This was like on a long haul flight out to Australia, and we'd done a stopover. And Ooh, there was this the there, dreaded stopovers. This couple got on next to me, and they had their kid, uh, and they were literally they had six different devices, and they put one in front of it, and it would cry and go uh, try, find, 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 find a different game. No, he doesn't want that game. Uh, find a different game. Oh, different device, different device. And, uh, until one of them quieted down, and I'm just like, oh, that seems a bit. I mean, obviously, that's me just judging on something. That I've, ne I've never raised a kid before. I mean, but I'm, when I'm we were kids, right, we had we had different devices and stuff. Mm -hmm. I remember the uh, like the MP3 free players and the mini disc players, and and that was kind of like you know there there wasn't a podcast on there, but I remember getting South Park clips, mm -hmm. like some of those South Park songs, and they're not songs. But you just found them online, you know, mm -hmm. using like LimeWire or something. And they were just like the thing that you'd listen to and you're a little bit, oh, you're a kid, you know, it's like swearing and stuff, <laughs> you know. And this is where you get taught. This is where you get your education yeah, from. You know, I've learned the words fucking bitch from South, South Park. Park yeah. um, but kids now obviously have this endless supply of content. I think YouTube is, is an is a interesting game. Um, yeah, I, I think they've just split their platform now. So now there's YouTube Kids mm -hmm. um, and YouTube. Yeah, because they were having that's... loads of issues with uh, their algorithms sending people. Like if people, if kids were just because it automatically plays on based on playlists of like you can have like kids things. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was this one where there was this cer certain cartoon that kids watched, but someone had taken the cartoon and done like filthy versions or b versions where people die or like there was this one where this baby constantly got hit in the head and died <laughs> and it would slip into the algorithm because someone had taken the same cartoon and just done their own version that was just really fucked up and <laughs> these parents would walk in on these kids just watching this little cartoon and then at the end of it this baby would get killed by something falling wow. on its head or something like that and it's like so I can understand why they've split it. Kids are impressionable, man. <laughs> really like, impressionable. Yeah, I mean, they they may not take sorts. it in, but it's like obviously I remember when I first started watching South Park, and my dad was like, "I will, I don't want you to watch this stuff. It's got like paedophile jokes in it, and all this sort of like." Hot, and at the time, I'm like, "I don't even know what you're talking about," but that's the exact point. I don't know what he's talking about, and I'm about to go. So, but with you know, with smartphones and with the ability to just Google anything, like are kids watching porn younger? Mm -hmm. 100%. That's fucked up. It may not be younger, but it's more frequent. Mm. So it's like when I when I I remember first watching porn and locking myself into How my bathroom. How old were you? Like I was eleven. I think that's young. Eleven. I think that's young. Yeah. But I remember freaking out about it. Like I remember being like, "This is something that I can't, I shouldn't be doing, can't be doing." But like, and it was like every like couple of weeks, I'd be like, "Okay, I'm gonna lock myself in the bathroom." Yeah. But yeah, now yeah. I feel like it's like it's like oh, I'm just on my phone. And that was me having to find, like, even, I know that, like, 
like we didn't have a TV in my house until we were like 11, 12 anyway. So we didn't really have technology. So this was me literally being like a scrap of paper with like a naked lady on it and being like, wow. What is this? I, <laughs> do, I remember when it was online and I was mm. like, it was on dial up as well. So you had to like, you know, yeah, do, 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 yeah, you know yeah, get yeah. online and thing. But it's interesting how it's all kind of, I don't know, like kids could probably like, cast like chromecast there they, i mean they're teaching yeah. kids to code aren't they i mean like at schools like you've and it's it was... it's a good thing man i mean it's a great thing i mean the education system is is, is absolutely backwards like mm. they're not actually teaching skills you know, I, that are I, useful. I, i've always hated school i was really nervous doing this course that i'm doing now that i'd go into it and hate it i just it just never f- suited me i was always but so... of course you do now sound right mm-hmm. so and it's, it's funny so, because, it's such a sound course yeah. i mean look there i did uh, i went to film school you doing sound like they are not things that were taught to us at 11 12 years old mm even though that you're more likely to go into a job in tv film sound video than you are going to do algebra and yet we go we don't understand that actually if we taught these kids you know how to use microphones how to use cameras Mm -hmm. then they're gonna be in a much better position when they do all suddenly want to be a youtuber they're gonna know how to do it and that's something which i find quite fascinating that we've just still not understood what the modern sort of job landscape looks like and then change the education system because of that. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure like, you know, private schools, I'm sure get to do a lot of stuff. Even with new academies, they, they specialize in certain things, but I've never seen, you know, kids coming out of, you know, school having made like movies, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? Or haven't done their own podcast. Like schools, all schools now should have their own podcast. I feel like all schools should just have like everything available, like anything creative. Anything, yeah. yeah, yeah like yeah. podcasts would be really, like just, like, I mean, at my school, I tried getting them to have like a radio or something or somewhere where, but I mean, it's just, they didn't feel like it's beneficial for kids. Well, I mean, they, it's not that they said it wouldn't be, but it's like, do other things. Well, look, I mean, the, the teachers are under so much pressure right now, and do they don't even get paid that much. No, I was saying to my friend who was like, I was a teacher, she was talking about how she was a teaching assistant with, um, uh, so like, more disabled children. So I didn't even get paid that much. I'm like, you just, you just can't expect to go into teaching, and you've got to do it for the love. It's one of those things, I think. Or you've got to do it for the love, or it's that old cliche, you can't do, you teach. And then you get some miserable teachers who are teaching yeah, things they used to care about. Yeah, but I don't necessarily agree with that, man, because I, you know, I think that you know, there's a lot of good teachers that could do it mm-hmm. if they if they really put. That. More importantly, I don't think it's as black and white as that. And you know, Never, sometimes no. you do meet a teacher where you're a bit like you're actually better at the subject than you are at teaching it. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of sports, a lot of PE teachers. Mm-hmm. I remember my old basketball teacher, or I guess you know, PE teacher, mm-hmm. but he was a basketball player. And he was like smashing three pointers, like swish, swish, swish. And I kept thinking, I was like, what is this guy doing here? Mm. Like, he shouldn't be like teaching us this. He should be like playing, you know. But but it's interesting. Now we can do anything we want to do because I guess we've got a lot more opportunities. It's just, it's just all about finding the motivation now. I think that's the thing that needs What motivates to... you then, Ruben? What's, what's... I struggle. I'm a very, a very, very, I struggle a lot with motivation. That's always, that's always been my biggest sort of like foible that's why being as in motivation to what like physical things or anything like, really anything, like yeah. I, it's I, I i don't like sitting around doing nothing but at the same time once i get going like of just like once i'm just, oh i haven't done that in a little while i haven't done that in a little while and i'll just be like oh well i haven't done any of it in a little while i'll just keep doing what I'm, do I mean, know? does it come from somewhere is this, I don't know. Is this part of your i don't know i think it's yeah i think it could be insecurities and sort of my sort of that fear fear of success and stuff like once i've actually done something now i've got to keep it going um yeah like i've like i've never i've never been very good at completing sort of projects but that's sort of like my aim at the moment so what, i'm what, with you there mate what's motivating me at the moment i'd say sort of just myself and the people around that's why i'm just surrounding myself with people and like trying to constantly be talking to people constantly be meeting people constantly be doing stuff like the other night i went to it was completely outside my comfort like comfort zone but i went with um nikki and we went to her crap pack like uh crack pack dance troupe that are doing festivals and events amazing and, yeah, and i went yeah. down they just like come down with they did rehearsals and they were doing like it was all kind of like dancing you like you had to do a move then i had to do, like change the move into Serious? something it, wow. like it's nothing that I've, like, i'm not a dancer in any way but i just i just went to do it to to put myself in that position to just to get the confidence out of it to get the mental thing out of it to bust some moves i don't i don't it's not like i don't like a bit of dancing but i'm just not a professional dancer i mean but but why like you know if if you don't do the things that you want to do on a daily basis Mm -hmm. like what do you expect is going to happen exactly exactly i just got you just got to keep doing it that's that's the thing i was talking to talking to a friend of mine who um who who wanted to like start creating content 
and like I've just started creating my content as well and they're like oh I might leave it till this point and then do that at this point I'm like you should just stop making stuff just start start putting bits out there if you feel comf if what because what she, what she's trying to do is sort of like comedy stuff so it's like if you want to do comedy stuff just let you get your phone think of some ideas just start filming stuff putting little stories out just start getting just your if, only for yourself if anything just to mm. keep yourself on top of it because my worst thing is it's like like I started doing stand up in Brighton did like a course that built up to me doing um a, like three minutes in front of 300 people in wow in, in comedia and it was the best feeling i've ever had That's in my cool. entire life blew me away like I'm, what did you talk about what were the jokes do you remember them um yeah let me so uh, oh, no my, pressure i my, mean my Oh no, because it all go it all goes in route. I haven't done that. That was like, the classic two years jokes ago now. like man walked into a bar. No, Ouch. it's all it's all very it's all very specific. So like obviously it was Jill, Jill Edwards who does a comedy course down there. It was it was a it was a good course. Um, I just I did the beginners part and then I went on to the advanced and then I kind of, that's where I kind of bailed on myself. I was like, oh, this is all. I started get like because I like trial by fire and like you went on to the advanced course and it's like you have. You, you do it to the same 25 people every week and then when Jill says that you can go do, you can go out, like once she thinks that you're confident once enough. Once you're funny happy, enough. And, yeah, 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 yeah. So you you can, gotta be funny you enough, can, right? you, you can go out and do it and it's and I, and I get that but at the same time, I just wanted to be shit. I wanted yeah. to go out and to be shit and to kind of, and then I did and I, and I got, because obviously I did that three minutes and it went quite well but everyone's there to see you. Like my biggest laugh was, <clears throat> my biggest laugh was between so I forgot my material. I knew, I went out there knowing I was going to forget my material because my my memory is quite bad with that. So I was like, I'm going to forget it. I'm just just be confident about it. Just be confident. Did my first joke. Uh, almost came back to me there. Did my first joke and then I paused and I go, oh no. And everyone goes, oh. and then I go, oh yeah. And everyone laughs because I've just rem they can see, physically see me and that's something real. And then they got a laugh of it. And then I pause and everyone starts going, Woo, you can do it. And I just go, hold on. Don't patronise me, all right? It's a little bit and different, And I just get right, this though. massive laugh just off of, off of... But you're obviously part of, you know, this is like a, a com comedy training, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you were at a comedy club, you would get crucified. 100%. And that's what I wanted to feel. That's what I... Because I, I see that. Like, can I not do any wrong? Exactly. And I spend... I spend <laughs> as, that's what it is about. I was like, don't patronise me. Give me some shit. Like, I'm up yeah, here and yeah. I just cocked up and I just paused and you, you had 10 seconds... You had you like 10 seconds it, of silence. Ruben. And it's yeah. like, you can do it. And I'm like, don't you patronise me. I mean, me. look, there's, there's so many comedy clubs that I've been to in my life, but there's only one experience. Uh, I think we went down to Blackpool. Fucking Blackpool, man. Random place. A comedy club. My parents were there. And uh, it was the worst comedy night we've ever been to. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, it wasn't a, even a real comedy club. Um, one of those like pop-up ones. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember this poor lady, she comes out on stage, sings a song on her guitar. And everyone's just a bit like, what is this? Mm -hmm. So random. And uh, someone said something and she ended up just like walking off stage. Just walked off. Yeah. That's brutal. Mm -hmm. That's brutal. But with comedy, you, you kind of have to get back up on that horse. That's, right? what it, that, that, that's what it's all about. And so I got, yeah, when I... When I finally got the confidence to kind of keep doing it for myself, I just I just couldn't do it. I just the course just didn't feel comfortable. So then I and then but then I haven't done it since I moved up to London. I haven't done it in about seven months. But do you have to go to these th these like training? Things no, 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 or, no. Because no. like you could start a comedy podcast, right, and just just get funny through. Hundred percent. Right. But then again, I. Again, that's I don't I don't like to be. That's not stand. It's you, I don't think you could then go into stand up. So it stand up is like stand up such to a stand up such a respect thing. Like even mm. though even though the even though the circuits spread out across the whole of England or the whole of the UK, everybody knows each other and everybody talks yeah. to each other to yeah, the point yeah. of where. So I I went to my first. So I was on this course and I seen this girl at the time in Brighton, and I brought her to an open mic that was that was before I started the course and I met a couple of people who had done the course, knew Jill Edwards, all this sort of stuff and I've just introduced and then, but she got hammered, like absolutely blitzed and she sat there, every person who came on stage, she would heckle and this is a tiny room, this is a room like, a, like heart, like actually no, maybe about the size of, of the room we're in now and you've got a tiny little stage that's on your level and then you've got about 20 people all like shoulder to shoulder sat down watching you and she's at the front and I'm sat next to her, this lump of a man sat there like as visible as anything with this tiny little mouthy girl next to me hammered going, 
at, like t- saying people's punchlines before they get to it, oh, and then her gross. shout, and then her shouting out like, "Oh yeah, but I got it!" And it's like, "Yeah, but they're open micers. Like, they're, of course, of course, the jokes aren't going to be like the smart. Like, they're but just how do they teach you to deal with a heckler? What's the what's the standard practice for dealing with a heckler? Ignore it. Shut up, you. Yeah, you either you either ignore it or you tear it to pieces. But you can't ignore it. You no, you, no, no, yeah, you can. You can't. Like that's the thing. The one of the best techniques is to go. What did you say? And then most people go, oh, whoops. Oh, I like it. And then what they just go, say? quiet. Yeah, what, did, what was that? Yeah. Like, and then they co- have to answer. Yeah, because they have to repeat their stupid thing they've just said. But again, cl- like every, now everyone's listening to them. You so put you the pressure saying, on them. Sorry, what did you say? Yeah, you they're just, like, you're crap. Yeah, what did you say? Yeah, no, but no, they they won't respond. Gar- no, unless they're yeah. like she was where she was just hammered. But then the thing with that is that every because the circuit's so small, I went to my first court, my first class, and she goes, oh, so apparently there was someone who's doing my course whose girlfriend got very drunk at this event, and and then afterwards she took me to the side and she was like, you can't do that again. Like, if you Jesus. do that again, you're going to get a bad reputation and people yeah. won't hire you. And I'm like, wow. She's like, literally, it doesn't take that long. But is this what you want to do? You want to go and, and be hired for these stand-up gigs? Is I'd that like to, be I'd, that's my That's my... I like to go out and abuse myself a little bit and stand in front of people because yeah, yeah. I, I think I think I'm humorous, but, I, but self-deprecating is that the word? Yeah, like it's it's it's, it's more so of that. Come at me, it's, bro. It's more of that me going to the gym thing, you know. The more of that, I need, I like burning that energy and I like feeling a bit shit sometimes yeah. because it means that when I bounce back up, because it's like. Yeah, I don't know. But it must build your confidence as 100%. well. 100%. I, definitely... I, I came off of that gig and I spoke for about six hours straight like I'd taken more drugs than <laughs> ever. Like, it, I, I, I came... stop chatting. I was a, uh, to the point where I was frustrating people. Wow. So do you think there's something so, that, da, like, da, 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 is it good for confidence? Like, if people are not confident to go up and do stand-up? I think it is. I think it's a really good thing for them. Like, there, a lot of people on the course that I was doing, they'd come purely just because they wanted the confidence side of it. They wow. wanted to be in a stand-up. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, they wanted to be a stand-up on stage. Age. They wanted to be to like say things that is vulnerable about them, like you, because it's comedy is all about at the end of the day. It's kind of about truth and making people laugh. Those two things combined. I mean, you don't have to be truthful, but you have to you you have to kind like if you like a couple of my favorite comedians. Chat absolutely. Who nonsense. who are your favorite comedians? Um, so I like a lot of American ones because it's basically it's kind of based off podcasting. So it'd be like Tony Hinchcliffe, who uh, who's killed Tony. That's one of my favorite Never heard of him. favorite podcasts. Then there's the your mum house your mum's house two pair I've which is Chris, Chris, Christina P and Tom Segura then obviously then obviously Joe Rogan no one really actually in England realizes that he's a stand up I don't think I've actually ever listened to him do stand up he's, he's yeah cuz half the people I say oh yeah uh, Joe Rogan's a, I like Joe Rogan as a comic comedian they're like what it makes a lot of sense now, though, honestly, because he's such a good presenter and mm-hmm. like he's very good at. Yeah, he, was, of... he was a comedian first, like it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, it was, yeah, so um, yeah, so I like that. Then English English comedians, it's sort of like uh, like Angela Barnes. I really like a lot. Uh, so um, I don't know English. I don't really go to. It, Who's the biggest comedian in the world right now? The biggest comedian in the world for me, I'd say. Talk, talk, it. talk wise you've probably still you've probably still got um who's that ginger guy that got his wheelie out in front of oh him? bloody um because he's still he, he'll sell out anywhere now because he's been turning up at places yeah his name's slip slip from my head jesus louis louis, louis, CK. louis, CK. louis CK. He, he's he's he on popularity wise he could probably sell out anywhere yeah. but i'd say america's still the top i'd st- i'd say someone like bill burr or maybe um, sort of like Doug Stanhope, who's like more of um, a comedian's comedian, uh, or I'm trying to think like that sort of that sort of thing. But there's um, there's some comedians that that very quickly move into movies. They very quickly become the actor comedian. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people who go into comedy wanting that sort of stuff, especially in LA, where 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 everyone goes for it. A lot of people go to LA and see comedians doing quite well and getting podcast appearances and then getting things off the back of it. And they go, oh, okay, if I just write a few jokes and get a few minutes. Because a lot of people go to comedy shows in LA to go see talent or find people they find interesting and then see what, this, what sort of work they do. And... Um, I think that it's, I don't know, I, I think it's, it's tough, frowned man. on. It, yeah. Com- the comedians, as I was saying, they're a small community and they're very, they, it's very respect based. It's very, how have you got here? How long have you been doing it? Are you funny? 
like yeah it's, i mean it's people very... love you know the uh the underdog story mm-hmm. right you know especially if they've been grafting for years mm-hmm. and they've been doing these comedy shows there is uh so i went to go see uh kevin hart at the o2 a few years ago and uh, i was really fucking pissed off man because kevin hart is one of my favorite comedians and um when we're there about 20 minutes before the show starts all these security guards are walking around kicking people out if they got their phones on mm-hmm. and they got these announcements saying that if anyone has their phone out uh, you know, even if the guy's not even on stage, you're going to be thrown out. Mm-hmm. So I saw people arguing with security guards saying, I was just checking up on my kid, blah, 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 blah. And they were getting kicked out, right? Mm-hmm. And I thought, this is disgusting. I didn't laugh once throughout the entire show. Mm-hmm. I was so pissed off. Kevin Hart comes out and is all like, you know, blah, 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 funny, 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 man. But half the people I was sat around have now been kicked out because <laughs> they, they went on their phone. Mm. And then, you know, and I was just annoyed, yeah? And I was there thinking, you know what? Like, you're not even funny anymore because you've kicked out people that have paid 70, 80 quid a ticket because they have their phone out. Now, I get it if you want to kind of like, you know, whatever. The point is, at the end, the guy says, I want you all to get your phones out and put your torch on. So that I can have my 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 cover shot, where a photographer comes on stage and takes a photo with like hundreds of thousands of people, like with their phones out, and I'm like, what a piece of shit! Jeez. Like Kevin Hart, if you listen to this, you're a piece of shit who doesn't understand how to piss people off. I mean, like honestly, but I get it. I understand that they mm-hmm. don't want little bits of their joke being leaked or whatever. But come on, man, it's not even that. I think it's more attention so like you hear i've been listening to joe rogan talk about that a lot recently because for he for a while he went through um you could get the i can't remember what the company's called but they'd bag your phones and you could only you could you had your phone with you but if you wanted to use it you had to leave the room and then they un, and then you got it unlocked outside of the venue and then you could look at your phone um instead of kicking people out and wasting people's money which i thought is fair enough it's, it's pathetic but then the you... moment you kick people out you're just like you know what like these people have paid money to see you mm-hmm. you know it's a bit like like if you went to to the, the bread shop you go into the bread shop you if there is a bread shop any, anymore <laughs> a boulangerie a, a boulangerie you get your croissants and mm-hmm. your, your sausage roll and then they're like oh by the way um we'll take that back because your phone's out mm-hmm. now get out of here yeah. like well it could have my money back no so but like I paid, and and I don't care what people say about this, honestly, because like there was a, about five, six couples that I saw around me that were being escorted out, mm-hmm. and you just like you know that's not what this should be about. I think know? I think it's 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 not it's not to the t- tone of what stand up comedy is about, which is no. like in the moment, what's happening now. Like it's I suppose it, they only really do that. They won't do that at club level. They never do that. At, no, you of course, be able to do but that dude, this level. is why personal branding is like so shit hot because it's like i've never watched another kevin hart show or mm-hmm. thing ever, ever again because he's put me off man yeah you know even the next time he goes and does a tour i'm like i'm definitely not paying 180 odd quid for me and my partner to go and watch you mm. you're joking right yeah. you know so suddenly I, I feel like you know comedians and like ev- ev- everyone is so exposed these days all of the time mm-hmm. that if some comedian who's worth hundreds of millions of pounds is kicking people out of his show for having their phones out and then request that you all get your phone out so i can make another few mil mm-hmm. and basically get you guys to make my front cover for me I think it's just pathetic. Yeah. Kevin okay. Hart, sort yourself out. But more importantly, you know, he did come from a background where he grafted, he worked hard. We all know his story, you know. Mm-hmm. And then he moved to Hollywood, become best friends with The Rock, and then the yeah. rest of history. Yeah, exactly. Got um, jacked. That's it. But it's interesting what you say about Louis C.K. though, because Louis C.K. is one of those people who, I think he was a much more independent comedian. He was funding his own projects. And of course, whatever happened with the whole getting your dick out type mm-hmm. thing years and years ago, no one cares. Yeah, because especially within the it's com- been said, especially within the comic, the, like the actual community themselves seem to be. But it's damaged him, right? Mm. It's damaged him hard. The, I think the issue that people are taking with it now is the fact that he his the first time he went out on stage, he didn't tell anybody. He just walked out onto he walked out into an already packed room, and just walked like in like I think it was in New York, and just was like, okay, I did my set. People apparently like some people laughed, some people didn't, whatever, and then. He he did a, a few of those where he'd just spoken to the club owner and obviously they'd know they know who he is and they know that he'll sell tickets so they're just like yeah she'll go out and do fifteen minutes or whatever and then now he's been doing going to festivals and selling out rooms and it's but he's not talking about the uh, well I don't know I haven't seen any of his stuff super recently but from what well I, he's come back uh, from he, from what I've seen he's but, come back but he's not talking about it basically everyone's like you're Louis C K you say anything you you're all about like 
sort of like self-deprecation and talking about real stuff and like getting a bit like dark with stuff you have like on your lap sitting this could this could tour for a whole year and you could sell out everywhere if you actually spoke about it from your mouth I don't think he mouth. needs the money man I don't, I I don't, don't know how much I, he's I don't worth. think he cares about the money but from the art perspective and from comedy mm. like if you walk out so if the comedian before you was shit hot and you come out on stage and you don't do something to to either bring the crowd down a bit or to follow what they were doing or to comment on it then it it sets like everything's disjointed like it well it isn't depends on what type of comedy but it's, it's that's a harder way to do it you kind of want to come on and follow what had just been on before you and so it's like in in this respect people are like what's just happened to you is all this crazy stuff where you haven't done comedy and now you've come back as if nothing's happened like there's such like the tension in the, all if i want to know just, right they want to know everyone's yeah. going everyone's going there to because they're like this might be the one where he says something about it or, well, look i mean um you know comedians i about to say politicians then but <coughs> i guess even a lot like politicians uh, a comedian will say something and years later it might be construed as something different so i know that mm -hmm. kevin hart recently had some stuff where you know People think he's homophobic because of the things he said in his comedy set. And when I saw the, you know, news clippings about Kevin Hart's being, you know, under scrutiny for what he said, mm -hmm. and they're quoting what he said in one of his shows, I remember that show. Like, so I, I hear it as the joke. I'm like, well, yeah, he talks about gays. I, I don't want my son to be gay. If my son was gay, I'd squash that out. Mm -hmm. But when it's reported on telly, it's as if he's literally come up and said, no, my son is not being yet, you know. Yeah. And so suddenly you're like, comedians have got to, to be really careful these days about what they say. I think there's, I think, I, I think they've got to be careful, but I also think the fact that, the fact, the fact that you've got to be careful, if you didn't have to be careful, nothing would be funny because nothing's like on the edge. Oh, he's yeah, just said right, something yeah, interesting. I'll buy that. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. especially for good, like a really good comedian. Like, I mean, you can be like silly comedians. You could be Michael McIntyre and like, you can live that life and you could be Peter Kay and you can just reference stuff. But people like comedians that are kind of really trying to write about what's going on. There's so much, there's yeah, so much. Yeah. It's, gold, it's, it's, it's a new golden era of, com of comedy. Like so all, pop comedy clubs popping up, like different places, like putting comedy nights on. Everyone's writing their own stuff. Everyone's able to share their own stuff. You've got Instagram, you've got Instagram stories. You've got all it's these all different It's all becoming hyper-relevant as well, and you, right? And everyone's talking about everything. The, yeah. only, the only issue is like, being there first or saying the uh, the original thing but like or... they all speak to a different audience right mm -hmm. there's uh i can't remember what it was uh, jonathan pie um real uh, left wing kind mm -hmm. of comedy guy he does these like news news reports where he stood outside parliament and talks you know about, i think i've, seen, I've seen him yeah it's quite funny right mm -hmm. um but actually like that very much appeals to a political kind of mindset of person who you know is is fine that's absolutely brilliant and they might just love him and go on his, his shows everything in the same way that louis ck appeals to his own audience so is there a type of person you want to appeal to as a as a, a stand-up are you are you always looking for someone who's I, a little bit more i want to feel like i could go anywhere i think that's the dream is that you can i could go to glasgow where people are, are notoriously shit to people who get on stage and aren't funny or places like that where it, and like and, and go to edinburgh and go to or like just where I, like being in brighton was great but that's just because it's like it's the soft place to go and do comedy like as long as you're not bashing like gay people or like like as long as you're kind of leaning a bit left and you're not doing anything that's too just like they'll listen to anything and yeah. they'll laugh and they'll clap and a bit, it can be a bit dry but then I just want, yeah, you want to be able to make anyone laugh. It's not about making a certain crowd laugh because then that gets boring. Like, what's if, the funniest thing you can think of right now? Oh God, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I kind of do. Um, oh, I heard a good one. I heard a good one. What was it? Um, oh, um, I'm going to join you with this. So I'm going to find okay. out the best joke. Oh, I heard... Actually, I've got a good joke. Yeah, go on. Go on. No, okay. So, um, <clears throat> so what did the woman say who had a thousand orgasms? What did the woman say at a thousand orgasms? Thank you, Cameron. <laughs> That's wrong. <laughs> I actually heard that from a gynecologist, you know, okay. which is terrible. That, I mean, I'm sure the gynecologist says that to a lot of people. Yeah, I'm, sure you're, not his, I'm sure you're not his first. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Another one is, uh, oh, I'm at risk of having a good time. Okay. <laughs> anyway, what's, tell me your joke. Come um, on. Uh, okay, so... my. I can't remember the one that I heard earlier. There was literally, I really want to remember this. It made me laugh so much. It caught me off guard. Um, it's not going to come. The, my issue is my memory. I need to have stuff in front of me. Um, 
Uh, no pressure, Ruben. There's, uh, all I've got is pressure now. Um, so, I mean, I could say, what, why, why are there no drugs in the jungle? I don't know, Ruben, why are there no drugs in the jungle? The parrots eat them all. There you go. There's, the there's, parrots there's, eat them all. That's, that's always the first. I like that. That's kind of like a kid's joke. It's a, it's it's a hundred percent like, a kid's yeah, joke. Yeah, that's it's, nice. It was, in, it was, my sister always used to tell it all the time. And so whenever someone is like, oh, tell me a joke. It's like, that's the only thing that, could, that sits yeah, in the yeah, front yeah. of my head. And I'm like, I can't just take it. I wonder it. if you could like take kids jokes and twist them on their head. You know, it's do, like. Do why, some backwards cracker jokes. Yeah, like why are there no drugs in the jungle? I don't know. The warlord is is sniffed another. I, I don't know. I don't uh-huh. know what this is about. The, but like, I get I get what you mean. I get what you mean. You want to try and send, you want to try and make it like kids jokes, adult or like yeah. buffer. It's that's is is writing comedy. Like I'm more. I like the technical side of it. Like when it comes How to actually, how do you do, write comedy? That's the, I didn't I didn't even know they wrote it until you know a few, few months ago. I was watching some behind the scenes stuff. And they do they write everything. Right. I mean, there's some like so Bill Burr, who's one who's one of my favorite. He he does a lot of getting on stage and just riffing but he's just amazing at riffing like he he i don't know how he comes up with the things he does but he's he's i think it's more of that he's so confident in himself and where he's coming from and he's got such a passionate and like in a lot of ways like anger and rage that he can just bring that out when it comes to writing and actually trying to put jokes it's basically just like anytime you think of an idea that you think could be funny putting it down so it's like I, th- I I talk to people who do illustrations because I do some illustrating and I talk to people who have ideas for podcasts or YouTube things and it's all of those ideas that you have that you go oh, that could make a good podcast that could probably also make a good joke like so it's just like twist so you'll hear something you'll hear something and you go oh I could do something with that content it's just whatever bent your heads that's what so at the moment I'm like trying to I hear something and I go oh okay, that could be a good podcast oh that could be a good joke and I've got all these things firing off and I just write it down like I got do you have like a book <laughs> no it's all it's all, all in this. your phone that's I, great though isn't it I could fire you off something that I've got. Like, yeah, I've yeah, writing, yeah. Like, Let's um, yeah, hit hit me with with some exclusive stuff here on is, Cam Talk. So this this is where it's all like not in joke form, but just in idea form. And then I've got a book which I then physically write down. That's kind of how my process goes. That's so, great. Though. I mean, like you start with a hundred bad ideas, you'll get a good one, right? At least one. I'm just trying to find what because that's the thing when you try and write. I in my notes, I just write down anything, and then it comes to the point of where I can't say this because that might be offensive. I mean, just say it, man. At the end of the day, like you know, I mean, I'm sure a few people are listening, but but there's it, you know. So here's here's something that's quite quite on the point of what I was Hit just me. saying. So this is this is just the premise. So don't t- don't tell people facts about yourself just in case you want to lie about it later. I thought that could be a good premise. That like you could find a joke. It's just, I like that. Yeah, very very BBC. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah, yeah. I like that. Like, and my, t- I, I've got to think about my tone of voice. So, like, when I get on stage, I, I have a tendency to kind of like very dry deliveries. Very. So it's almost better to kind of like say mundane things that people like. I don't know. It's hard. That makes sense. It's yeah, a hard, yeah. You kind of want to say something that that adds to the dryness. So people go like, "Is that meant to be funny?" I don't. I don't actually know why people laugh at me. I've never been able to work it out. I always thought I was a bit wacky. Then I had someone come up to me and say, "You remind me of Jack D." And I'm like, "Jack D's like the least wacky comedian wow. there is." He just yeah, yeah. again, just that dry sort of thing. So, um, trying to find. I, I wish I, I wish I could remember some of my jokes from that fir- first set. I, first set I did. I've got them all. I've got them on the tip of my tongue. But for it's funny. I'm actually on your Instagram right now. And uh, just checking out some of your 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 previous your previous photos. I mean, so like, how long have you been doing these illustrations? These, these illustrations are hard, man. Um, I've been drawing all my life, uh, and it was so when I I learned to read, write, and draw from the Beano and Dandy when I was younger. So my granddad, I've got like a load of a load of Beanos and Dandies from like the sixties and stuff, and I'm sure like a few of them are worth something, but they're all been. That's we, what everyone thinks, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But we've got uh, we've generally got a massive collection of from like through from like sixties to the when I stopped buying them, which was probably like uh, like early two thousands. What did you just draw the draw the the cartoons? Yeah, so originally it was draw the cartoons and do like my own little doodles, learn how to do I'll do Dennis the Menace a thousand times, blah blah blah, and then eventually I just started and then but I was also drawing my own things, and it's just kind of I'm very. And I've, it's only recently I've started. I need a plan before I start drawing, then have like an idea, and then like it becomes something. It, I, for most of my life, it's been pen to paper, draw. Usually, I start with an eye, like I draw an eye. I love a good eye. Love a good eye, and then kind yeah. of build up around it. And I don't know, like my art pieces, I'm trying to make them into so like a whole book. It takes me a long time. It takes me a really long time. Like I've got two books that are on the go at the moment. I want to start a third. Um, that I just I pick a random page. 
and draw on it. And then I'll come and then I'll just keep doing that until I've filled the book and then I'll come back and I'll do a layer over the top and then I'll do color and then I'll add through and then ink will run through onto the other side and then where the inks run through I'll find like a drawing inside the negative space of the ink and but it just do you takes think there's, a lot of there's time. a market for comedy for illustrators uh, like the things that only illustrators find funny yeah I mean you know, there's, like, there's, like, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> in jokes for like designers as well right yeah there's 100, 100% know? like I mean you go to a lot of comedians do private functions where it's a, a like a meet up or a presentation of awards for people like that and then comedians come and it's like oh okay so I've got to talk to designers or I've got, and then of course like they'll go okay so what we got to designers so it's like oh you don't use paper anymore do you everything's, everything's but this is <laughs> fun right so, so tell me so do you, do you look back at your life and think well these are the things I, I can talk about these things I know about like rugby uh, you know growing up in mm-hmm. a family which is like super creative like these are things that you use to to create a joke. Mm-hmm. So as, uh, when I say the reason I like about podcasts, that nitty gritty, the jokes are kind of the same thing. So it's like I could, you could tell a joke about rugby, but people want to hear the joke about you in rugby or you getting hurt in rugby. They want to hear it like, the, if I've, like what's I, the funniest thing that's genuinely happened in rugby? What's the funniest thing? I mean, in in. It depends on your perspective of funny, but when I what don't worry I, about the delivery of what, the joke. What, just what, you know. what, I, what I thought, what I thought was funny, not was that there was a guy. So, I mean, rugby has a culture of outside of the pitch that a lot of messed up stuff happens. Like I've seen a lot of people naked, a lot of people doing promiscuous stuff on other people and a lot of people convinced to do a lot of stupid stuff when they're very drunk. And I remember um, a friend of mine telling me that they got convinced by they were all very drunk and they all went to have a shower and they all had they all had to have a a gay off i think wow, they called it a gay off where they had to touch each other in the showers until one of them got an erection and the first one who got an erection lost that's really tough that's really tough that's a and really then, tough game and then, and then that's just like wow rugby is a rugby is a weird one but then it's like finding jokes in that like obviously like that's not that funny but no, that's just no, a, but at the same just, time like but then but then it, i think the funny thing in rugby is the is the everyone's gay like it's like everyone's everyone's really into each other and always talking about their bodies and always want to <laughs> touch each other and like let's get in the shower boys and oh and like it's literally like but it's such a masculine but sport, then, and right? then if you even m- breathe the words that, of like that they might be in like oh you like what's going on here they're oh, oh, uh, 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 you're about to get like hit so in the but what, why is that you know like because like obviously i mean i don't know if there are many gay rugby players uh not many out no and and when they use this shame right usually it's like post their rugby career they'll be like oh yeah i'm gay yeah and then people in their club like people they trust in their club will know but then they won't especially professional level they won't say anything there's about something it. about big groups of <laughs> lads that you know whether you're it's at the army mm-hmm. sports teams whatever like they they act very gay mm-hmm. as like a, as like a thing to bring people together mm-hmm. but are not actually gay yeah yeah it's I, interesting. I lads to, are fucking fucked up and that was right? my funniest thing about rugby was just winding them up i used to love winding them up completely like like so they're fair fair enough they'd get drunk and they'd do stuff but i loved being when they were really sober or hung over and then i'd go and just like gently caress their leg like, how are you doing this morning and be like, <laughs> hey, I'm really what the fuck are you doing don't touch me i love it i loved it and i like, just come in come in with my pink socks on and my short shorts and be like right boys how's it going and it doesn't bother me like i just i liked enjoying my security and my sexuality and then watching them cringe it was the funniest thing in the world to me absolutely the funniest thing so listen area ruben we're coming to the end of the podcast but i want to talk a little bit now about what you're going to be getting up to in the next uh few weeks you said that you Mm -hmm. you struggle to motivation sometimes Mm -hmm. i'm going to hopefully help you uh motivate yourself Uh, to get your podcast going, you know, what's your big challenge? What do you want to achieve in the next couple of weeks? So the next couple of weeks, I want to try and get, I'm going to do two, I'm going to do one record. So, okay, next week's my last week of my uni course. Amazing. Da-da. Graduation. <laughs> so I get, so I graduate. Um, it's only a six month sort of, pra- it's like heavy practical based trying to, it's all about networking and branding and this stuff. So I'm going to come to the end of that and I've got two, I've got radio jobs lined up. So radio jobs, just loads of stuff. So I want to try and get, one podcast recorded next week, another podcast recorded the week after, and then once I've finished my course, I just want to, once I've got those two down, try and do a couple of week, get like a whole series. Um, oh, I literally got so much stuff going on. I wanted, I've, I'm doing stuff for, I'm doing stuff for Soho Radio where I'm helping out with my colleagues to record a series of 
stuff to do with the Get Loud project, which is like they're pairing up with Nordoff Robbins, who's like to do with mu- music therapy and mental health. Nice. Fingers in, in many pies. Just I like to... it, man. I like it. Well, look, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what happens over the next mm-hmm. few and I'll months. Get, I'll and I'll get you onto my podcast as well. You can come tell I me about what fucked to. you up. Do you know what? I would love to talk about that. Like, uh, Yeah, I mean, that's a good idea for a podcast. What fucked you up? I think it's it's hard. I mean, look, this is all going on public record now. So like, mm-hmm. that's the hard thing, right? This is like public therapy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, so it's it's about it's about. Do I, I pay you for I this? Think is this like <laughs> like, can I pay you and then just like you? Just... I mean, I'll take the money. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I'll take the <laughs> I'm money. A donation yeah. spot in the there's, middle. There's a there's there's a definite. The, that's where I'm finding an issue with this podcast at the moment is the how I come into it. Once you've got people talking and you kind of understand their initial relationship with their parents, you can kind of go for it. But it's that initial breaching. So what's your relationship? But is this like supposed to be a comedy podcast? It's not, it's not comedy, but so I want to go into it with a lighthearted sort of aim. And then when it comes to sort of when if they would if they say anything that's sort of like deep or if they say anything that, I want I want to I want to basically go I will take out anything you want me to take out but I'd like you to feel like you're comfortable no, to talk. no no you can't do that that's that's like a number one rule of podcasting <laughs> man get, you can't like I, chop I, out. I, I get it but I just want to let them know that if they're yeah that makes sense, if they're te- yeah. if they're telling me a story and at any point they want me to stop I will stop I want I want them to feel comfortable so it's all I feel like it's that first you need like a bell or a whistle or something I think Nikki brought me in the, some the, kind of the doom flute the I've doom heard the flute of, yeah mm-hmm. like, like moves change subjects yeah, exactly. but, but that's hard man because actually you know we want to hear everyone wants to hear that's what we they, that's hear what they the want story, to hear right? so I'm I'm thinking light hearted and then if they want to talk about stuff they can talk about it maybe you should pre pre like audit you know but look okay give you know let's talk about three or four stories mm-hmm. that like you're comfortable talking I've got I've got a couple of key features in it that I think will help. Like I've got a key, I've got a feature a feature in the I got a feature in the middle which I think quite works quite well um, to get people talking about things. I just I'm just going to work out that intro and I'm going to because I, yeah I'm going to have a chat. I think the best thing to do is to have an off mic chat for ten minutes, warm people up, and then come in with so. I think I just got to come in kind of hard. Just come in, just so Go straight what's, to yeah, it. What's your yeah. What's your relationship with like your family? And of course you got to know what the the tone is like, right? Because mm-hmm. like you know if. If if it is not a funny story, but you can add elements of humor to it, is that that's it? So is that going to be your forte, or are you yeah? Just gonna so be there, I'm like, going to try and I'm going to try and I'm going to try and find the points where I can kind of keep it, keep the ball up, just keep it floating, just keep things so it's not so people don't feel like I'm pressuring them into talking about their parents. If you make me cry, man, honestly, like that that shit. Will I'm, go t- viral, I mean, I'm an emotional person. I'll be crying with you. I yeah. guarantee, guarantee you. I'll hug it out. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I like that though, man, because like there's something about podcasting that now allows us. I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, don't don't lie because at, at one point, you know, you're gonna listen back to this and you'll be like, you know what, this is the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's something about picking out those old stories. It's quite therapeutic. Yeah. You know, like I've only I've discussed a few things on this podcast already that's made me think about it and like, yeah, actually, there's a reason why I'm now like this, and it's I think it is a little bit because of of that story. So mm-hmm. I'll be very interested to hear more about that. I uh, I'd love to get you on the show again. Yeah, um, please. Yeah, I've got, I, yeah, I've got I've got more ideas that I've, that I've got coming up and trying to get other things going like comedy podcasts, and I've got sort of. Uh, past experience podcast you know i I, I'd, I'd, know, I'd also like to learn more about comedy <laughs> like you know like i think it, it is something you know i i was always into dance when i was younger so my confidence came mm-hmm. from just doing stuff no one else was doing but i'm not very good at like you know making people laugh i'm just ne- neither am I, like i'm not i'm i'm far from the best i'm i'm a bit shit at it but i just like the feeling of doing it i like the feeling of writing i enjoy when people laugh and i just like being involved in the world so it's like that's why i'm trying to come at it okay podcast i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna take so a this podcast is a great to... way to learn comedy essentially mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But so, yeah, um, it's a good way to feel comfortable making jokes with people that you're comfortable with but i'd always i'd always say if you want to do comedy just go stand on a stage and feel and literally like listen to that choir <laughs> i don't know man i feel like there's there's new mediums like now now that we've got podcasting mm-hmm. now that we we can i mean we can we can do it in our, our daily life we can talk to them because that's the thing the big a big thing at the moment that um comedians are oh, like that old and old what you might even be called old school comedian now is getting upset about is youtube stars people they've never heard of who have bigger followers followers than them who are, have never worked have never done a club ever like a, a comedy club but are doing theaters like selling out tens of thousands of seats to people, just YouTube stars. Who I mean, just... they're hot, man. They're popular. Yeah, like, you look and... back in the days of like Vine when they had to make people laugh in mm-hmm. like seven seconds. It's like, but in my in my opinion, they're not. They might structure stuff, 
but then it's like it's just crowd pleasing comedy like their their fans are coming to see it's that thing of like okay so who are the people you want to make laugh they have people who laugh already like Kevin Hart shows yeah people come to those and they expect to laugh they'll laugh at whatever he says like it's it's not like it, he might go to clubs where he struggles like David uh, Dave Chappelle I think he's amazing like he'll he he'll turn up somewhere unannounced somewhere where they may not be expecting him and may not be his crowd because that's where he wants to do comedy and he like, likes it yeah. he likes the the risk right yeah, and it's all about go, go go on after someone who's fucking killing and yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and f- like have to try and follow them or that sort of thing just i think that's that's what i love about comedy even though i'm not good at it i enjoy that feeling of like i, just, I don't know man i mean like surely i mean you could be good at comedy i mean uh, I t- I'll tell you what we'll do. Why don't you? Why don't you? In- we we'll play that insult game, mm-hmm. right? Okay. You insult me, I'll insult you. Mm-hmm. We'll do that a few times until one of us crying. Your audio quality is terrible. Oh shit! I knew you'd go straight for that. Go straight for the joke. Your hat looks stupid. My hat looks stupid. Well, I mean, so does yours. Yours is backwards. Who wears backwards hats anymore? Are you Ash Ketchum? I am Ash from Pokemon, and you've got long hair. Oh well, thank you very much. So I mean, you. that's that's silly because that's. <laughs> Long hair. Yeah, yeah. Well, so do you. Go on. Go on, get your hair out. Get your hair out for the people. You want me to get my hair yeah. out? I, I, we'll, 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 we'll have a hair off. Right, oh, it's all coming out now. <sighs> who's got hat, the longest... Who's, who's got... The longest hair. My, Actually, this is... Um, I've got more hat hair than you. You have much more much hat more hair, hair than, than you. You've got a bit of a peaky side cut as well. Mm-hmm. It's um, it's quite nice. Yeah, I feel like... Yeah, you've, you, were, you, you were the lumberjack Ash Ketchum for a minute. Well, this yeah. is it. All right, <laughs> now I'm a beetle. <laughs> Hello, mate. I'm Paul McCartney. You're Justin Bieber Justin from 10 Bieber. years ago. All right, well, look. I mean, like, on the basis that, uh, you know, we are getting to the end of the show, mm-hmm. I want to just thank you very much for coming Oh, honestly, on. it's been a pleasure. And, it's been... Uh, it's, it's, it's good for me to come and get involved and I, you're a creative guy and it's not nice to to be part of it yeah well That's we're right. going to talk more my friend ruben thank you very much my friend up here take care that was, that was good see that's good sound uh-